Welcome everybody, my name is Caleb and this is your new and improved C++ series on this channel. We did a series before, but it's been a few years and I think it's an appropriate time to go through some more C++ material. So we'll try to cover some new things, also a new approach and new perspective. Overall, I think either series will do, but going forward I'm going to recommend this content for beginners getting started, or if you have some experience but you want to learn C++ for the first time, this series is for you. Now I want to give some theory of C++ before we just jump in and start typing stuff. I want you guys to understand why you might want to learn C++ and how C++ is different than some of the other programming languages out there. Because C++ is often considered a lower level language. And when people say lower level versus higher level, this is referring typically to how close you are to the computer hardware. So for example, if you build a website with HTML, JavaScript, this is very high level. You build that website and anybody can access that and there's multiple layers away from the computer system it's running on. So you can imagine you have a literal computer, like let's say a laptop or a phone, and then on that you have an operating system which manages that hardware and memory access and all those low-level things. Then on top of that you have applications such as Google Chrome, and then inside of Google Chrome you have that JavaScript code executing. There's multiple layers away from that computer hardware, and therefore that's considered a high-level language. C++, on the other hand, is considered lower-level, because this is actually going to be compiled and executed directly on that computer. Compiling is a process of taking the C++ code and turning it into something machine code that the computer can run and understand. Because of this lower-levelness of C++, it's often used for very intense applications. So if you can think of any category of software, there are typical examples of software that need a lot of performance and these are most likely going to be written in C++. So for example, video editing, Adobe, it's written in C++. Databases, the type of tools that power many of the websites and applications out there, typically written in C++, such as MySQL. Blockchains, these, such as Bitcoin, are typically written in C++. Video games, very popular for C++ developers. Games such as, say, Call of Duty are written with C++. So by learning this language, you can create a lot of very intense applications. So you and me, we see this as a lower level language. It's used for these intense type of applications, but at some point in history, this was actually seen as a higher level language because we started off with assembly. This was how people could start programming computers to do whatever they wanted. The challenge with this though is that if you wrote an application to run on one type of processor, say an ARM-based processor, you would have to basically do that again for a different type of processor, such as x86. Now for this series, you don't have to understand the difference between those anymore anyways, because C came along and basically added a new layer of abstraction to where you can now write software and you don't have to worry about the different system architectures. C is cross-platform, can run on multiple different operating systems and architecture types. Fabulous. This was basically one of the major improvements when it came to higher level languages. Now you just have to learn a single language, C. Then C++ came around and made it even easier. So now we can introduce object-oriented programming as well as various other things inside of C++. This was a higher level language that made coding a lot easier compared to C. So at this point in time in history, C++ was a higher level language, but as we continued to build more layers and introduce new languages like JavaScript and Python, C++ is fairly low level. So it's not really the recommended programming language of choice if you're just looking to, say, build a cute little website or just a little script that you need to execute every so often. It's really ideal to learn if you, say, need an application to do some lower level stuff, you know, interact with the system that you're on. So that's why you might want to learn C++ at a practical level. We talked about some popular use cases and how C++ stands when it comes to low level versus high level. But what about when it just comes to language theory and would you want to invest the time learning 
learning another language, specifically C++. My opinion is that if you want to have that solid foundation of computer science skills and software development, C++ is a great language to learn. It's very difficult. And you'll find that learning material for C++ is like this, where this is the, the C++ primer. It's like a quick start guide that's like over a thousand pages. So it's not an easy task to pick up and get started with C++, but it's going to introduce so many things that you might not get or experience in the same way with a higher level language. So I feel like I have a deeper understanding of how things are working behind the scenes because I've learned C++. So we'll start off with just the basics. How do we get an application running? A hello world essentially and you can go from there to build graphical user interfaces and even mobile applications if you're using the right tools so you could do something like that with tools like c builder which is the sponsor of this series this is an editor that allows you to create applications that are cross-platform but even if you just want to learn the foundation of this language you can use this tool to easily work with c code so that's the easiest way to get started. This is the C++ Builder Community Edition. You can download that, install it, and then just start writing C++ code and run it, and you're good to go. I'll drop a link down in the description if you want to get started with C++ Builder, which is the editor I'm going to be using for this series. But the thing I wanted to emphasize is that it's not the editor that really matters. It's this right here. This is C++ code, and this is going to be the same regardless of what operating system and what editor you are using. So this is a Windows application, so if you're on Mac, you can find something else, or I just use Parallels, which is a really easy way to get started where you can have multiple operating systems within your Mac operating system. So from Parallels, you can just launch a new virtual machine, hit continue, and then just choose Windows 11. Then you'll have a completely functional operating system inside of your operating system. So once you have your operating system installed, go download C++ Builder Community Edition, which is forever free. And then you can say file new and console application. That will bring you to this here where you can write your CPP or C++ file. Then you just run it hitting this play button and it'll bring up a terminal with whatever you told it to output. So let's talk a little bit about this code and what is going on. And trust me, if you're new, as you keep going, this is going to end up becoming a second language. You're just going to be able to look at this and understand what's going on. So don't be intimidated if you're new and there's a bunch of syntax and characters and stuff. The main thing to know is that this gets a lot easier as you go. The main thing is this main function. A function just executes some code and this is the syntax. You'll say int and then main parentheses left and right and then inside of that you're going to have a curly brace at the start and then a closing curly brace at the end. This is everything you want to execute when you hit this play button. The things that we want to do is see out or output some text hello world and then we want a new line so that way it goes down to the next line and then this next line here this will just keep that terminal open so when we hit play it stays open. When we remove this line and run it, it'll compile and it will just close out of the screen. So that's why we have that line in there to say, hey, we don't want to close out of this until we are sure we're done. Then this return zero just means, hey, everything went as we expected. So that is your first C++ program. You might be confused also about this line here, which will basically just allow us to do input and output or I.O. And that's what makes this C out here work. C out, you can think of it as console out. So that's how you write to the console. So we're going to go through writing all of this code in the next videos. Don't feel like you have to be able to write that on your own or understand every piece of it. I just wanted to show you a basic application and show executing that so that we can see we told it what to do and it gave us something in response. I hope you're excited about this series. We're going to cover a lot of interesting things. This can be your C++ primer and you don't even have to read a 1000 plus page book. So hopefully that sounds great to you. Stay tuned for the upcoming episodes.
Hey, welcome back to the party. This is episode number two in your C++ series. This video, we are going to start from nothing and build out a small application so you can actually get some experience writing code and understanding that code. So what we will do is we will ask the user a question, get some input, and then respond to that input. So just some experience with input and output inside of C++. So to get started, we are going to be using Embarcadero C++ Builder. This is the sponsor of this series. You can go download their community edition and get started for free. When this opens, you can create a new project and we're going to go with a console application. Hit OK, and then again hit OK. Now when this launches, there's going to be a bunch of stuff open, which you can hit these little pins to hide over to the side, which will just clear things up a little bit. You can see over here in the projects, we have file1.cpp. That is the file we currently have open. That's where we're going to be writing our C++ code. What we can do is actually save this and change the name of the file. I will just call this YouTube. So now we have youtube.cpp and it doesn't make a huge difference, but we can change the target platform by right clicking and add platform and choosing Windows 64 bit hitting OK. Now to get started, I'm actually just going to delete everything and we are going to write this from scratch. A couple of other things, you can hide the projects and you can zoom in right here to make the text a little bit bigger. So let's go ahead and start by saying int main and then a set of parentheses so open parentheses close parentheses and then i'll usually hit enter and go down to the next line we will do an open curly brace and then hit enter and you can see it automatically puts the closing curly brace and this is where our code is going to go and we will say return zero now when we want to show something inside of the terminal we will need to include another file. So to do that, you go to the very top and type pound include. And then inside of angle brackets, so a less than sign, we will say IO stream and then close the angle bracket. So the uh, greater than sign. This is going to allow us to use input and output. That's what IO means, input output. And we're going to use another include here, which will be used for working with strings. So we'll say string. Now a string is just a sequence of characters. That's what is going to be given to us from the user. So let's go ahead and go here and we will write a new line and you're going to type std colon colon c out. This is how you write to the console and then you're going to do two less than symbols or left angle brackets and we're going to create a string here. So again, a string is just a sequence of characters and you define that inside of double quotes. So we'll say something like, what is your name? This is what it's going to look like. Now at this point, you can compile and make sure your code works. It's going to ask us to save our project. So again, I'm just going to call this YouTube. It'll compile and it'll pop up for a second and then disappear. So basically it outputs this string and then it's like, oh, our code is done, so we can close. There's a few ways to fix this so that it doesn't automatically close. One of them being to say system and inside of parentheses, you're going to say pause and then a semicolon. So at the end of every single line, we're going to have a semicolon with the exception of when we are using parentheses or curly braces. So inside of the curly braces, every line inside of here, we're going to use a semicolon at the end. And you'll become very familiar when to use semicolons and when not to, so don't stress too much about it now, mainly just copy the code as is. Now when we run this, it'll compile and it says, what is your name? press any key to continue. So this press any key to continue is going to always show up there whenever our code is done running. When you hit any key on the keyboard, it closes. So you'll notice it was all on a single line and the fix for that is inside of these parentheses, you can do a backslash n. So this is a special character that's going to be interpreted as a new line. Now, when we run, it says, what is your name? press any key to continue. 
Cool. Now a few things before we get that user input, I wanted to mention that we have this std colon colon at the beginning. This is basically saying, hey, where is this C out that we're using coming from? It's coming from the standard namespace or std. It can get a little redundant typing this out and pretty annoying, but it's a good way to prevent any kind of naming conflicts. And we'll talk about that more in the next video and throughout the rest of this series, but I'll show you a shortcut so you don't have to continually type std colon colon before things. So you can delete that, and now it's going to be confused. What is the C out? Where does it come from? And up at the top, we can basically say, hey, if we don't specify, we just want this to assume using namespace std semicolon. Now it's going to assume that the C out is coming from the standard namespace and we don't have to prefix it with std colon colon. Now I know I'll get some comments about best practices and everything. This is an easy way to get started. However, as you get more complex applications, this can introduce naming conflicts and we will talk about that more in the next video. So we got a way to display on the console, but how do we get user input? The very first thing we're going to do is we're going to say string name. This is defining a variable called name and a variable allows us to store information. That information can come from the console using C in. And now the angle brackets are going to be pointing the opposite direction. So we're going to say C in name. That is how we're going to take the name from the user and store it in a variable. This will allow us to use it later. So we can say C out name. Now, if you remember after the C out, it doesn't automatically do the new line. So if you wanted to have the new line, well, you can't just type it here because we're not inside of quotes. So the other way of doing this is to do another set of angle brackets and then do the quotes. So that is what it's going to look like. Now let's hit run and what this code will do is it will first ask us for our name. I will say Caleb and it will repeat it back to us. You can see I typed Caleb and it repeats that back. Let's follow the code to make sure we understand. We say, what is your name? We define a variable. This doesn't actually cause any output to show up. Then we allow the user to type some information and we store it in that variable. Then last thing we do is we just output the exact name that they typed to us. We could easily build on this to do different things. So for example, we could add a string in here saying your name is and then a space so it looks nice and then it'll have the name and then we could put a period that would come after the name. And another thing is if you already have the previous terminal window running, it might complain. So you can see we have it here. So we will just X out of that and then run our code again. What is your name? Caleb. And it says your name is Caleb. So that is a very basic example of how to get user input and display it in the terminal. There's a lot of different pieces here, but this is the foundation. These are the building blocks Memorize these structures and we will continue to use them throughout the series. I promise you if this is your first time doing C++ or your first time coding, it does get easier. The concepts will get harder and challenging, but the way you do user input is always going to look something like this. So you start familiarizing yourself with a different way of doing things and you start to understand the language. Just like learning a foreign language, it's not going to come to you overnight. It takes practice and repetition and seeing code being used multiple times. So go through this video again if you need and actually type out the examples. If you're just watching, you're not going to actually put it in your brain for long term use. You need to type it out yourself to get some of that experience. Now a few more pieces of information that can be good to know, but aren't essential for actually typing and running this code. If you want to understand what's going on behind the scenes, there is a program called a preprocessor that takes these includes, these include directives specifically, and it will include that code in this file. 
which allows us to use certain things that already exist. That way we don't have to recreate the wheel whenever somebody has already created code for saying, you know, let's write to the console. We don't have to build all that functionality from scratch. It just exists and we can tell the, the preprocessor that we want to include that code with and include directive. Depending on how you compile, you might not need this include string. So if you're running this on Mac or using a different C++ compiler, you may not need to type that at all. There are different C++ compilers and different operating systems. So some of the code throughout the series might not be 100% exactly what you type out if you're running on a different platform or using some different compiler. So if you want to follow along exactly, you will want to use the C++ Builder software, which I will drop a link down below. That's all I got for this video. Stay tuned for the next video where we're going to talk about more concepts and some potential issues with the way we wrote our code. It's nothing major. We're not doing anything super technically incorrect. This is all correct code, but there are some concerns you should know about. So stay tuned. I'll see you in the next one. What's going on everybody? This is episode three of our C++ series. This video, we're gonna talk about some more vocabulary for some of the stuff we've written and just review what we got, make sure we understand it all and talk about some potential problems. So let's review some of the terminology that we've used so far. The very first thing is we have a using. We talked about the includes in a little bit more detail in the previous episode, so we'll start here. Using makes it easier for us to type code, but can cause problems later on when you have a more complex application and you have things with the same name. For example, C out right now is coming from the standard namespace, but what if there was another C out from a different namespace? How would C++ know which one we're talking about if we don't prefix it with standard like so? That is the issue that I am talking about. So some people will just not use using namespace standard and just prefix everything. But for the very basic code we have now, it's not a big deal. We could always go back and change our code as needed. The next thing I wanted to talk about are functions. So this int main parentheses, this is defining a function. And the name of the function, the identifier of the function is main. The term identifier refers to whatever we're naming something. So we're naming this function main, the identifier for our variable is name, and if we built any more custom stuff, we would probably have to give it an identifier. The main function is required, and it is the start of our code. Later on, we will create more functions. For now, this is all we need. We will always have these parentheses to find after the function, which we will learn about what those are used for later on. But basically, it's where we can define parameters. Each function is going to have a return type or void if there is no return. So what does that mean? Well, right now you can see this is int. And what that means is when the function is done, it's going to return some data that is of type int. Zero is an integer and that is of type int. You can think of ints as whole numbers, but positive or negative. So negative one, negative five, five, 20, zero. Those are all examples of integers. Now a variable, this allows us to store some information. We will define its type here. So this is a string variable and it will always be a string. Now we talked about new lines with this special backslash n here. That's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it, which I didn't show is Let's say we just want to end the line here. You can say E-N-D-L. That is another way and you don't need quotes. However, if you wanted to keep that period, you would have to do that separate. So it would look like this. So oftentimes when I'm working with strings and I want to end there, I'll just put a new line. And if I'm working with variables, I'll just use end L because it's a little bit easier. Either one's fine, it's no big deal. Now we can execute this code multiple times and every time we run it, it's going to restart from the beginning. So it'll compile the first time and that takes some time. If we went and ran it again, it's going to be much faster. It doesn't have to compile again because we didn't change any of our code. Now we can run this, we can say Caleb and it says your name is Caleb. I can run it again, it starts from the complete beginning and I can give it a different name and it says my name is John. So every time we run our code, it's like starting from the complete beginning. It has no memory or no concept of what we did in the past. 
If we wanted to write software that has some memory of, you know, what was our name the last time we were in this application, or something like that, then we need to store that information in some file. Often this is going to be a text file or a database. So we will learn a little bit about reading and writing to files in this series. This is going to allow our application to have a memory if we wanted to say create a shopping list application or whatever it may be, you can do that, but that's going to require writing to a separate file. The last thing on here is this system pause. This is a hack to basically get the terminal to stay open. And you're probably not going to use that in a production application because at this point the application is done and it can just close itself. So for example, if you, if you created some custom menu and it said, do you want to quit? You type yes. You don't need the code to then say, type any key to continue you can just have it shut at that point. So this is going to be here for our example, but we don't really need it in a production application. So now that we have a bit more of that background behind us, I wanna talk about this using in more detail to at least show an example where it might be a problem. First, let's show what it would look like if we did not say using namespace STD. We would have to prefix certain things with STD. Not everything though. If you try to run this and you don't have correct code, it's going to give you some errors and these will pop up in a window. And it doesn't know what this string is because we didn't prefix it. So we'll have to say standard, same thing for cin. So the question is, what do you have to prefix? Well, anything defined inside of the standard namespace, which includes cout, string, cin, and end line. So we would say standard, oops, not in capitals. That's another important note. The capitalization does matter. So let's go ahead and try this. We don't get any errors and it works the same way. The benefit of prefixing everything with STD is it prevents naming conflicts. Let's say instead of calling this name, we called it something else like C out. Obviously that's a bad naming choice because we know that already exists here, but technically this could work. So instead of putting this in the name variable, we'll put it in the C out variable and we'll change it here as well when we display it. This works because C++ can tell that this C out is different than this C out. So when we run this code, you can see it works just the same way. If we instead had using namespace STD, well, then we would remove all of these and this is going to be a problem. So obviously we have a problem here and you can hover over it to see what that problem is or when you run it, you're going to get that error. You're gonna see there's a ton of errors that showed up. can bring those messages up and you can pin this if you wish. And it's complaining that we have some bad use of operands. So obviously this is just not going to work. So let's go ahead and undo that. We can just say control Z and that'll start undoing our actions. So obviously be careful what you name your variables. I'd say it's totally fine to use using namespace STD as you are learning, because you know if we have a naming conflict, we can just go change our code real quick. The problem is if you have a code base that's you know millions of lines or whatever it might be, it's not easy to go and change everything. So with smaller applications, no big deal. I wouldn't worry about it. I know I'm gonna get comments saying, oh, you're dumb, you're doing it wrong, either way. So I'm not gonna worry about it. I'm probably going to keep using namespace STD to make writing code simpler. That way we don't have to worry about prefixing everything all the time. We can just focus on whatever we are learning at the time. There is another option I wanted to show you guys, and that is you can say using namespace STD, but only for certain things. So we can say using namespace STD colon colon C out. And actually when you do this, you're going to remove the keyword namespace. We're not importing an entire namespace. We are just importing one thing from that namespace. Now, whenever we say C out, it's going to assume it's coming from STD namespace. But for C in, we're going to have to keep it. So let's go ahead and change this back to name. Sorry, I didn't undo all of the way. So my changes aren't here yet. 
So let's go ahead and fix that. And in this situation, we're going to have to prefix everything else with STD. So that should be working code at this point. And obviously in this situation, I think you can just keep standard if you accidentally had that or you typed it out, that's no big deal. You can still prefix if you've already said using, but there's no need to. But just to show you that that works, we can compile this. That works just fine. And we can also just remove that. So just to, you know, try different things. So let's run this, make sure it works. What is your name? John. And it says your name is John. Perfect. The next video, we're already going to start talking about branching in our software. So basically, how do you do different things depending on something? This is often called control flow. This is done with an if statement, and that's what we're going to be talking about in the next video. Definitely be sure to subscribe and stay tuned. I'll see you then. What's going on everybody? Welcome to episode four in your C++ series. This video, we are going to be talking about if statements. Depending on how much experience you have with software development, you might be thinking, what's the point? Like, what are we even doing? Well, it's not really super clear the value of coding until you can actually change the output of the code depending on some input. Whenever we use applications, they're very complex. They do things based on how we interact with them. It's often not just a linear application that does the same thing every single time. So with if statements, we can make more dynamic interactive applications. And this is where things get exciting you can create very cool custom stuff. So let's go ahead and create a dynamic application which will ask the user if they want to play a game. And then the user can say yes or no. So this is the code we have from the previous video. We're going to do something pretty similar, but it doesn't hurt to rewrite. So let's go ahead and just delete that. We will keep the system pause and the return zero. Now let's go ahead and we will say using namespace std instead of just having the C out. So that way we can save us some typing for everything. And we will say C out, do you want to play a game? And when you ask the user a question, you will often want to give an example or a description of what kind of response is expected. So inside of parentheses, and these parentheses are still inside of the quote, we will just say yes slash no. So that way the user knows that we're expected to type a Y or an N as a response. And generally people are going to understand that Y is yes and is no. Although you should also assume when writing software that everybody's an idiot and is going to type something totally incorrect. However, we're not going to worry about the edge cases for the majority of this series. We're just going to worry about the basic functionality. You can build on this to, you know, worry about some of the different possible inputs. But for now, let's just worry about getting this working for someone who uses it correctly, which is typing Y or N. And we'll talk about a few variations. So for example, you might want to allow them to type yes or a capital Y. We're going to talk about some of those, but we're not going to cover every scenario of what the user could possibly type in. So let's go ahead and create a variable response. That is where we are going to store what they say. And we will say C in response. And then let's go ahead and respond back to them with what they typed. You entered and we will end the double quote there and then use another you can chain these operators. This is an example of an operator. So we can chain these together. So you can have two of them as we've seen. And we'll just say response and L to go down to the next line. Now this is the part where we start typing the if statement. You will say if, and the structure for this is parentheses and then curly braces. So very similar to the function syntax where we have the parentheses and the curly braces. The same idea. Now inside of the parentheses, we're going to create some expression which will evaluate to true or false. If it evaluates to true, whatever's inside of these curly braces will execute. So let's go ahead and write this part first since it's really easy. We'll just say, let's play a game then. So that is what we will do if they say yes. The question is, how do we check to see if they said yes? If you want to give it a shot with some research, pause the video 
and give it a go. And if you've done any programming before, then this is probably pretty familiar, but for those of you who have not, you will basically do some comparison and this will evaluate to true or false. Now I wanted to call out an important thing here. You can see we're getting an error and this is an invalid expression. So what that means is the comparison is invalid because I'm using single quotes here. So single quotes allow you to use just a single character but this is still a conflict of types. So what we'll need to do is use double quotes. So this is basically a string with a single character in it. I know that's a little bit confusing, but just an important note, you will want to use the double quotes on this character. So let's go ahead and try this out. Do you want to play a game? We say Y for yes, hit enter. You entered Y, let's play a game then. You can see it works. Let's go ahead and try again, but this time typing in N for no. You entered N, nothing happens. So the thing inside of this parentheses here is known as an expression. Specifically, this is a comparison. And an expression in general is going to evaluate to some value. This will evaluate to true or false. True and false are known as Booleans, and they exist as keywords. So the keyword false and the keyword true. So if you just as an example type that in here, if true, this is always going to execute and there's a good chance the compiler will realize that and just remove this section altogether and just always output what's inside of it. But just so you know that true is a keyword and false is a keyword. So you'll probably see those pop up. Now let's talk a little bit more about these equal signs. So we say response is equal equal to y. We use two equals here because that is how we compare. This is the comparison operator. An operator takes operands, in this case the response string, and the this, this string literal y. Literal is when it's just typed out like that. And it will compare to see if they are the same value, and if they are it will return true. So this is kind of like a function, which we'll learn more about functions here soon. That's all I got in this video. Hopefully that was a good introduction to if statements and some other vocabulary. This is kind of one of those things where I'm trying to teach these principles as we go and build out a more complex example. So we might not necessarily have a dedicated video to expressions or to comparison operators. And I think that's okay because you can learn the foundation here and you can learn all of the details with some additional research or when you need to reference material later. So that's all I got in this video. Stay tuned for the next one, which is going to be about some cool functions. Welcome everybody to episode 5 in your C++ tutorial series. In this video we're going to be talking about characters and functions. So this is specifically going to be talking about when we take a response from the user and that response is yes or no and we take that in as Y or N. What if we wanted to allow them to actually type out yes or no? And we wanted them to be able to use an uppercase Y or a lowercase Y if they just typed out the single character. You can allow for multiple variations and create a more user-friendly experience, but you're going to need some familiarity with functions to alter our data and some experience with working with strings versus individual characters. So we talked about this a little bit in the previous video, and this all has to do with double quotes versus single quotes. So we are currently allowing the user to type Y or N, and this is being stored as a string. And this is very important to understand because C++ is statically typed. By static, I mean the type for a variable is defined at compile time. We hard code what type it is, and it's going to remain a string for the entirety of its life. So when we tried to use a single quote down here and said, hey, we're looking for the character Y, this was complaining because it can't compare a string to a character. So if you wanted to use just a character, you could say C-H-A-R, which is another type inside of C++. Now that error goes away and this code should work the way you would expect. 
basically the same thing. We didn't change any functionality. Do you want to play a game? Yes. You enter Y. Let's play a game then. We just changed the type to show that you can do that as well. So characters are just a single character, anything on your keyboard, and it's surrounded by quotes. Now we talked about the backslash n. This is also a character. So even though it takes two typing, uh, two keystrokes to type it out, it's still just a single character and it's interpreted as a new line. The thing is, it's kind of difficult to type out a new line. So how do you represent that? That's where the backslash comes in. We're basically saying, hey, we want to interpret this character in some other way. In this situation, it's as a new line. There's a few other escape characters that you can learn about if you want. But that's not what we're going to be talking about in this video. So let's go ahead and undo that to a Y. Now, what happens if we take a string and we just wanted to compare the first character. Let's say they typed out yes, and I'm going to use double slashes here. This is how you make a comment. So this is going to be ignored by the compiler. It doesn't actually change any of the functionality. How do we basically say, hey, let's take a look at that first character and see if it is Y. You can do that with square brackets and a zero. So the square bracket zero is how you say grab that first character. Yes, it's weird that it's a zero and not a one, but arrays and strings are all indexed starting with zero in code. So this is index zero, the E is index one, and S is index two. So let's go ahead and try this. In this situation, we have a string, but when we use the indexing, this returns a character. So response of zero is of type char, not of type string. So that's why we're not going to get any complaining from the compiler. And it works as expected. So if we say yes, it says you entered yes, let's play a game then. And if we run this again, and we say why without the yes, it still works. Cool, so now we've introduced some variety, made the code a little bit more interactive. The next challenge is what if we wanted to type in either a lowercase or an uppercase Y? So we say Y with a capital, and you can see it's not smart enough to realize that this is the same concept and that the game should be played. To fix this, we can use a function. So we've defined a function here, this main function, but defining a function and using a function are two different things. So there are already some defined functions created that we can use in our code. So if we want to use a function, what we do is we say the function's name and pass whatever data we want to give it inside of parentheses. So it's going to look like this. Right before response, we're going to say to lower and then put response inside of parentheses. So running this now, if we type in a capital Y, it's going to take the capital Y as input, lowercase it, and then compare the lowercase version to the lowercase Y. This data here is known as the argument. So now we have a lot of flexibility in our code. We can type yes with a capital Y. So you could say yes like this, that works. We could say anything that starts with the Y, even if it's Y no, and it works. So, you know, maybe it's not perfect, but it depends on what you want to do. If this is how you want it to work, great. If you want it to work a different way, even better. Go ahead and code it the way you want it to work. That's the cool thing about coding. You can make it do whatever you want. In the next video, I want to talk about an alternative way of getting a character from the user. Stay tuned and be sure to subscribe. What's going on everybody? Welcome to episode six. This video, we're going to be talking about an alternative way to get input from the user using get char. This is a function and it does exactly what it sounds like. It gets a character from the user. So although the way we currently have things works, I just wanted to introduce an alternative. So we are going to call a function get char and then we will assign the result of this to a variable response. So this is what it's going to look like. We don't have to pass in anything to get char, but it will return the character. So if we wanted to store this as a char, 
we would no longer need to say response index zero, we would just get that first character. So we'll remove the uh, indexing there and run this. And we can say why, and you can see it works the way we would expect. I also wanted to talk about the interesting relationship between characters and integers. So we could actually, instead of saying char here, say int. And let's go ahead and run this. You can see it compiles fine. Do you want to play a game? We say why for yes. And it says you entered 121. Let's play a game then. What is going on? How is Y121? And how does this work even though we have this as a number? When we're comparing this to Y, you would think 121 would fail and this would be false. Well, there's actually an association between integers and characters. And you can find this in an ASCII table. So you can see a table, and if you look for 121, you can see that is Y. So that is where the 121 comes from. Let's try it again. And this time we are going to say capital Y. And you can see we get 89. So that is right here. And it's an uppercase Y. So every character you're familiar with gets some ASCII code. And it's basically an association between a character and a number. So that is why you see the integer version here and why the code still works. So a character and an integer are kind of the same thing. It really just comes down to how we interpret that data. Do we interpret it as a character or do we interpret it as a number? And you can actually change the way it's displayed. So if we wanted to take a number, convert it to a character and display it, we can do that. I'll show you how to do this. If you wanted to store this int response as a character. So after we get the character and it's stored in that variable, you can create a new variable. Let's just call it R, just cause I don't know what else to call it. And say static underscore cast. And then inside a less than and greater than symbols, you'll say char. And then inside of parentheses, you will say response. So this is how we go from an integer and cast to a char and that's going to be stored in a char variable. And once we have this R variable, you could actually print that instead of the int version and run. So now when we say yes, it says you entered Y. So that is just an example of static casting. You can also just do that in line if you wanted. So I could cut this here and paste it here passing in that response. That's how you would convert it to a char. Run. I'm just going through a bunch of different examples here. I know we kind of gotten sidetracked from the original point of this video, but that will work as well. But obviously it would just make more sense to use a char here. So let's just go ahead and do that. We'll say, actually, let me show you one more thing. So we'll say int response. You can just define and assign that all in one. So this is the declaration and then we initialize it with some value. You could also see, instead of static cast, you could just see char with parentheses like that. We'll run. And that will work as well. There's some minor differences between the two, so char versus static cast with char passed in. For simple examples, usually just doing this works fine, but the recommended way is to use the static cast. But enough dorking around, let's go ahead and restore this to how we had it. So char response, and then we can just print response. So that is your introduction to get char, an alternative way of getting data from the user. Hopefully that was helpful. Stay tuned for the next video and be sure to subscribe. Peace out. Welcome everybody, in this episode we are going to talk about the else clause for an if statement. This allows you to decide what happens if it evaluates to false. In our current code, the way we have it set up is if this evaluates to true, it'll execute this code, and then it ends. 
If it's false, it just ends. So we can't say something like, oh, well, thank you anyways, or come again soon, whatever it may be. Because if we just went down here and said, see out, let's go with something like maybe next time, goodbye. And we'll make the new line character. This is going to output no matter what. So when we run this, even if we say yes, it still says maybe next time, goodbye. So that's what the else clause is here to fix. Basically, we can say else, then we will want to output this. So we'll say else, another set of curly braces, and this time we're just going to surround this code and indent, which, quick note, the indentation is 100% totally optional, but it is highly recommended. This is basically a good way to format and structure your code, but the white space itself is not significant in C++, meaning this is completely valid code. Now obviously this is limited. There are certain things that if you do add spaces, it's going to mess up. So for example, you can't add a space here that's going to split the operator. Or if you add spaces inside of quotes, that's going to be interpreted as characters and change the output. But the indentation is still a good idea. But because it's not strict, it does introduce sometimes people writing things differently. For example, you might see if statements written like this which is more similar to what you do in JavaScript. No big deal inside of C++, but I've grown to do it this way. Or you might also see the else on its own line like so. Now let's try this out. If we say yes, then it'll output the true option. Let's play a game then. If we say anything other than yes, like bananas, it'll say maybe next time, goodbye. Notice how it just grabs that first character, B. Now, why not? Let's talk about another option, which is else if. This is how we can compare against some other value. Let's say they had to type in N exactly, or, you know, close to it, either no or capital N, similar to yes, but we don't just want them to be able to type whatever they want. If you wanted to do that scenario, just as an example, you would create another set of parentheses here and create another expression. In this case, we'll say to lower response and we will compare that to the character n. When you define an else if, you can now have the option for no output if it doesn't fit either one of those. So do you want to play a game? We will say yes, that works. Let's play a game then. Let's try it again with N, and it says, maybe next time, goodbye. And then finally, we'll try something else like tacos, and it doesn't do anything. Now, you might be wondering, what if you wanted that option of it's not yes, it's not no, can we say something custom for that? Well, yes, you will just have an else. So the else is the catch all. So now our structure is going to be if, else if, and then else. So we will go here and say, else. And just as an example, we could say, hmm, I don't understand. And now when we put in bogusness, is that a word, bogusness? I don't believe so, but bogusness, it just doesn't work. And we can also put the uh, new line. But the computer now is smart enough to understand that it does not understand that input. Do you understand? Now, whenever you see repeating functionality, such as this too lower response, it should give you a thought in your mind of how can we extract this functionality into a single place. So in this scenario, it introduces a situation where you might forget to type one of these. Let's say you typed it like this. So if response is n, you know, you might take a look at this, oh, it seems right, but you forgot to type that part, and now you have a bug because an uppercase y works, but an uppercase n does not work. So that is why repeating code is generally frowned upon. It's very easy to make bugs, and bugs are bad. So we never actually defined a bug, you probably understand just from the context of what I'm saying, but if your code compiles and it runs, but it does not work the way you expect it to work, that is a bug, also known as a logical error. Something is wrong with your code such that it compiles and runs, 
but it's not working the way you expect. So to fix this problem or this potential problem, we can remove this two lower altogether, like so, and move it up here. So what if we just said, hey, whatever this character is, let's just lowercase it right away. And we can do that by just passing in this function call to the two lower function call. So the nesting can be a bit confusing, but whenever you have nesting, it evaluates from the inside out. So this evaluates and returns that character, let's say it's Y, and then that Y is then passed into the outer to lower function call. That response is then assigned to this variable response. Then we can just use response directly. We don't have to worry about uppercase or lowercase because we already did that at the beginning. Now one downside to doing it this way is that you have some data loss. Let's say they inputted the uppercase Y and then we converted it to a lowercase Y. This is just a very simple example so it's not a big deal. But anytime we do some kind of data conversion, we might not be able to go back and get that original. So we might not know if they typed it in uppercase or lowercase. This could be pretty important if the person's typing in their name and you know their, their name might have certain capitalizations for you know fancy last names or whatever it might be. If we just uppercased or lowercased everything, we're going to lose that original data. So that's the only problem with this scenario. In the original one, we had the original response and we could always refer back to it. So if you wanted to protect the original data, you can just create another variable. So as an example, you could say the new one we are interested in is response filtered, whatever you might want to call it. So we basically clean up the data. We lowercase it, we remove any junk, and then that's where we invoke to lower passing in response. Now response, we're just going to keep it as the vanilla get char. So now we have both of these. This first one could be the uppercase Y, and this second one could be the lowercase Y and then you can choose which one you want to use. So we could compare response filtered and response filtered, but we could display the response. So what that means is we might be able to run this. Do you want to play a game? Uppercase Y, and it says you entered uppercase Y, but the comparison still works for the lowercase Y because it's using that filtered variable. So that's just some more practice to increase your uh, coding chops. But this to me is kind of complicated because this is not a scenario where I feel saving the original data is that valuable. This is more just a uh, hypothetical example. So what I will do is just undo back to just having that single response. And to me, this is a lot cleaner and makes sense. So this is what I would recommend in this scenario. Now, as you start introducing more and more branching with if statements, things get more complex and there are more edge cases you need to test because now you can think about, you should probably test Y, N, and then something else. But you should also consider capital Y and lowercase Y, uppercase N, lowercase N, and then something else. So you can see it starts getting more and more complex. As you continue to create software, you will get introduced to the concept of test coverage. And basically, what percentage of possibilities can we reasonably check to make sure they are working the way we expect? Some people will shoot for 100% test coverage. This can get pretty intense, so that might not be appropriate for all scenarios if there's like unlimited possibilities. But in this scenario, there's only like five or six main ways to use this code. So you can get pretty good test coverage just by manually entering a few different inputs. So just keep that in mind as you're designing your code, the least complex software is going to be the easiest to continue developing and the easiest to prevent future bugs. So always try to keep it simple if you can. Thank you for watching. Hopefully this video is helpful and stay tuned for the next one. Up next, we're going to talk about nested if statements, which are fun and can get a little crazy. So I'm excited. See you in the next one.
Welcome everybody. In this video, we are going to talk about nested if statements. This is when we define an if statement inside of another if statement, and it's only going to be evaluated if that section of code is reached. So in our example, we can ask the user if they want to play a game. If they say yes, then we can ask them what difficulty they want the game to be played at. We're not going to ask the difficulty if they say no, we're not going to play a game. So that's the example we're going to try to accomplish, and it's pretty similar if you want to give it a shot. Basically, just ask the user what difficulty after they say they want to play a game. So hopefully, if you pause the video, you were able to get that figured out, but I'm gonna show you the way I'm gonna do it. And with that, let's get started. We are going to now talk about nested if statements. Here in our code, we only want to ask them if the response is, yes, I want to play a game. So we'll say, let's play a game then. After we say that, we will define another if statement. And inside here, we will ask some other comparison to see what they say. So what are we going to ask them about? Let's say what difficulty they want to play it at. What difficulty? And then we will end that there. Since we're not putting the new line, they will just type it on the same line there. That's why this one doesn't have a new line either. And we will give them a suggestion on how to use this. So easy, medium, hard. And then we will get an input. So let's go ahead and define a string difficulty right there. And then we'll say C in providing a value for difficulty. Now let's go ahead and check for what that value is. If difficulty is equal to, and now we will compare against a string, easy, what we will do is output something to say that the difficulty is easy. Right now we're just really just outputting strings, but as you continue to build upon this, you could actually configure the game settings if you get that far, but just outputting things is the easiest way to understand these concepts. So we'll just say easy peasy lemon squeezy. Beautiful. And similar concept, we can do an else if. So we'll say else if. We will put the parentheses and some other expression. Difficulty being equal to. And this time we'll say medium. And we'll just put a generic C out as well. C out medium. Good so far. And then finally, we will do another else if difficulty is hard. And for this, we will just say C out hard. There we go. So let's try this out. We will run. Do you want to play a game? Yes, I do. What difficulty? Medium. And it says medium. Let's try it again with hard. Do you want to play a game? Yes. What difficulty? Hard. And it says hard. Honestly, I thought I had more to say. That's pretty much it for nested if statements. In the next video, I want to talk about logical operators, which are very important for comparisons. So definitely stay tuned and I'll see you then. What's going on everybody? In this episode, we're going to talk about logical operators. These are the operators and, or, and not. Now we're going to mainly focus on the OR operator in this video, but it's going to be very similar concept for the others. So let's understand the concept in this one, apply it to our example, and the others will be a piece of cake. So what we have now is you choose a difficulty, easy, medium, or hard, and these all have different cases. Oftentimes you will want to do something the same for multiple different cases. So let's say easy, medium, and a heck, why not hard to? If you choose any of these, the same thing is going to happen. And we'll make a fourth option, difficulty impossible, where something else happens. So as an example of where this might make sense, easy, medium, and hard, you can respawn. You can continue to play the game if you die. 
But in possible mode, if you die, the game is over, so you have to beat the entire game without dying. So let's talk about how to set this up, where we do the same thing for easy, medium, and hard, and something different for impossible. We will start by removing these sections. So we just have one section here, and it doesn't really matter what the output is here. We just want to say if the difficulty is easy, or if the difficulty is medium, or if the difficulty is hard, then do whatever this is. And we'll just say something like respawning enabled. So to do this, we will use the two pipes. And this is the character right above the enter or return key. And it stands for or. And then you will make another comparison. So difficulty is equal to medium or difficulty is equal to hard. So now all three of these are going to say respawning enabled. Let's just test this out. Do you want to play a game? Yes. Let's play a game then. What difficulty? Medium. Respawning enabled. If we try it again and type something else, let's say we go with impossible. That's not one of the options, so that is not displayed. If we wanted to do something special for impossible, we can make an else if, and in this scenario, just compare again to check for that value. So if difficulty is impossible, then we can just say something really encouraging like, LOL, good luck. Now, both the easy, medium, and hard section should work as well as impossible. So we can type out impossible and we get LOL, good luck. So for the OR operator to work, let's just kind of break this down. It'll compare and see if this is true. Is difficulty equal to easy? If it's not, it'll check the next one. And it'll keep doing that until it hits a true value. So let's say difficulty is not easy, so that's false. It'll try this one. Difficulty is medium. It will stop the evaluation there or short circuit it and jump right into this section. In order for this section to be hit, any of these can be true. Or all of these can be true. Two out of three can be true. It doesn't matter. In this scenario, it's impossible for multiple of these to be true because difficulty can only be one of those values, but we could put any kind of comparisons in here. It doesn't always have to be using the difficulty variable. So one or more of these expressions have to evaluate to true. The final value will be true or false. That's how the OR operator works. Now there is also an AND operator. So for example, you could have difficulty is impossible, and let's just make up an example here and you beat the game before and that you could say is equal to true like so or if it's a boolean which we're going to talk about that in more detail in the next video you could just leave it like so so that's the and operator and in this scenario both of these expressions have to evaluate to true so it'll test the first one if it evaluates to true, it'll check the next one. If it evaluates to true, it'll check if there's any more. As soon as it hits one that is false, it'll no longer check and it'll short circuit as false. So you can do more researching on short circuiting, but basically it's an optimization. You don't need to keep checking things if you already know if it's true or false. Now I also wanted to show a common mistake. You do not want to do this. It's very easy to do this. I've done this before. So let's remove this here, because since that's not an actual variable. Let's just say we wanted to check if difficulty was easy, medium, or hard. You might think to do this. It's easy, or it's medium, or it's hard. Let's try this out. We will run this. Do you want to play a game? Yes. What difficulty? Tacos and it says respawning enabled. So it evaluated to true even though we didn't use easy, medium, or hard. And that's because this is just a string. It's not comparing it to anything. And a string is going to evaluate to true. So basically you're saying difficulty being equal to true 
or true or true. And the way the ors work, if any of these are true, the entire thing is going to evaluate to true. So you're basically saying, hey, we always want this to evaluate to true because we put something that always evaluates to true in here. So this is a common mistake that you don't want to make. You always want to make sure your copying difficulty is equal to for each one of these. Now, another tip that can prevent some bugs is whenever you have the OR operators, don't mix those with AND operators. It's too confusing to figure out what logic is going on so just do those in separate sections. So let's go ahead and restore this to what we had before, where we check for all these different values. And we will leave it like this. In the next video, I want to talk a little bit more about Booleans. This is the concept of true and false, but I got a little bit more detail than just, hey, it's true and false. So definitely check out the next video where we can get a little bit more comfortable with true and false. Bye. What up everybody, this is episode number 10. Congratulations on making it this far. Yeah, that's about all I got for this one. We are going to be talking about Booleans, which is a type. So sort of like string or char or int. There is also the type bool. And the value can be true or false, which is a keyword in C++, so you don't have to use any quotes around it. So I'll show you some basic usage of Booleans and how to be more comfortable with them. So we're going to keep the code that we have, but we're not going to be building directly on this stuff right now. So let's just go ahead and move it all down. Instead of creating a new project or a new file, we'll just do it up here. What I want you to do is say C out, and you can actually use a comparison operator right here as an output. So let's try that. We'll say hello. And is this equal to hello? Now this is going to give us a warning, but don't really worry about that. This isn't something you would do in real life, but it's an interesting concept. This will evaluate to some value. Oh, that is actually important. So if you hover over this, it has higher precedence. So what that means is I forgot to surround this with parentheses. Basically, what was happening is it was just outputting hello, and then it was like, oh, what's this extra stuff at the end? But now since we put this in parentheses, parentheses always get evaluated first. So hello being equal to hello should evaluate to true, and we will output the output. But the interesting thing here is you will actually see the output one instead of true. So one represents true and zero represents false. So if we went ahead and you change this comparison operator to not equals, this will invert it. And this is the warning that I originally thought it was, which is the results being unspecified. So that basically means it's unsure exactly what's going to happen or it's not defined. So it can depend, I guess, on compiler version or platform or something. Not entirely sure, but you can see it, it's working in our case and this is just for illustration purposes. We get a zero. So that is true and false. You can also output just true, lowercase true. And this will also output one. So because there's no quotes around it, it's in a Boolean literal. Let me type that out boolean literal whenever you see the word literal it means the value typed out so this is a literal character this is a literal string this is a boolean literal if we put quotes around it it would no longer be a boolean variable but would become a string literal cannot type there we go which is different so make sure when you're working with booleans and you are trying to do logic that you don't accidentally add the parentheses because you could easily make a mistake in what you're comparing or what you're trying to do. So let's go through a more concrete example. Let's say we want to build that functionality if they've beat the game before. 
Now, because we haven't really gotten to the capabilities of reading from files or databases, we will actually just ask the user, have you beat this game before? If you were building out a real game, you could actually save to a file that they beat the game whenever they beat the game. And then you could read back that data later when you run the code again. But let's just say that after they say they wanna play a game, we could ask them if they've been in the game already. So we'll say bool, which is the data type for a Boolean, beat game. And typically this will be written as like a question. You can imagine a question mark here, have you beat the game? And once we define this, we can then take input into that variable. So beat game. To do this, we will want to ask them a question so they know what to do with this. So see out, have you beat the game? And you can format this however you want. Let's just, as an example, create a new line and then say zero is no. And then another new line, one is yes. This is super ugly, so I don't know if I would keep the formatting like this, but just to show you, this should work. So let me just show you what it looks like. Make sure you don't have any errors yet. Do you wanna play a game? Yes. Have you beat the game? Zero is no, one is yes. And then you could type in one of those values. So let's go ahead and check to see what they put. Since this is a Boolean variable, when we check it inside of an if statement, we don't have to compare it against anything. That is a little shortcut that is good to know. If you, for example, said beat game equal equal to true, just imagine for a second that beat game is true. It's kind of like saying if true is true, which does make sense, but this is just going to evaluate to true. So it's unnecessary typing. You can just type the variable name. If beat game, which is either true or false, then what are we gonna do? We'll just say C out. Because you beat the game, you can play impossible mode, just as an example. And then we'll just put a new line. And now you can use this later on. So going back to that and operator example we used in a previous video, if they said that they have beat the game, if difficulty is impossible and beat game is true, then we can output this, which could then allow you to further build out this if else if sequence. So else if difficulty is impossible and not beat game, which will invert it. This is the logical not operator. This will evaluate to true if beat game is false. So in this scenario, the difficulty is impossible, but they haven't beat the game yet, to which you could say, you have to beat the game at least once. So let's just test this out, see how it's going so far. Let's say we do wanna play a game. Have we beat the game? Let's go ahead and say yes. Because you beat the game, you can play impossible mode. Just say impossible, LOL, good luck. First area of improvement, you could probably say after this here, use secret difficulty. And if you wanted to say quote it, you could use single quotes like this, and that should work fine. But if you wanted to use double quotes, it's going to confuse the parser because basically it looks like you're ending the initial double quotes. So here's the opening double quotes all the way to these closing double quotes. So you can escape them using a backslash, similar to how we do backslash n. When we do backslash quote, it's saying, hey, we want to use the actual double quote and not using this for the syntax. So we could do that for the end here as well, backslash double quote. So now we should see impossible in quotes, and then we can put a period and a new line. So let's run this. Do you wanna play a game? Yes. 
let's play a game then. Have you beat the game? Let's go ahead and say no. Or, no, I want to make sure that looks right. So let's go ahead and say yes. Because you beat the game, you can play impossible mode. Use secret difficulty, impossible. Perfect. And then we'll say impossible. A little good luck. Now let's try it where we have not beat the game, but we still type in impossible. Yes, we're going to play a game. No, we have not beat the game. What difficulty? Impossible. And it says you have to beat the game at least once. Let's try once more just without any use of beating the game and no impossible. So it would look like this. That would be the regular use and it works fine. Now at this point I would call it, it looks pretty good, but for practice sake, I wanna show you a scenario that might introduce bugs in your software if you're not careful. And I mentioned this in an earlier video and that is using and operators while also using or operators in the same complex conditional, meaning multiple things combined using operators. So here we have an example where we're checking for multiple things. Let's say, in theory, you could only choose easy, medium, and hard if you haven't beat the game. So you would basically say the difficulty has to be easy, medium, or hard, and beat game has to be false. And you can notice it's actually warning you here. Also, this white line, I think, is just saying, hey, this is the recommended max length for lines. Could probably adjust that or whatever, but it doesn't really matter. This is going to introduce a logical error where beat game could be true, but as long as you choose difficulty, easy, or medium, it's still going to let you through. So let me show you this. And it's going to compile because it's just a warning. Warnings don't prevent you from running the code. It's just some like extra beneficial tips from the compiler. Do you want to play the game? Have you beat the game? Yes. And in theory, based on what our code should be doing, if I say easy, medium, or hard, it should not evaluate to true, but it still evaluates to true. And you could just surround these in parentheses to fix this problem but I just feel like it's still kind of difficult to understand the logic of this line. So I don't know, I tend to break it out when possible or just avoid ors and ands in the same line, but that's just personal preference. You can do whatever you want as long as you understand it. So now in this situation, what we want to happen should work. Have you beat the game? Yes. And if we say easy, medium, or hard, it does not let us play the game. So in that situation, it might do something else, like say, hey, you have to play in possible mode or whatever. This is kind of a theoretical example, so I haven't built out the entire if statement, but you get the general idea. So that is how you would do that, but I'm going to opt for not doing that because I just don't like that. And it doesn't really make sense to force people to play a harder difficulty. I think you should still be able to play easy, medium, hard, no matter what, but that's just my opinion. Up next in our life, we want to talk about the switch statement, which is an alternative way of checking the value for something and doing certain things. So kind of like an if, else, if, else, but it's going to look a little bit different. Stay tuned for that. It's an important thing to understand because you're probably going to run into it at some point in your lifetime, like in the next video. So stay tuned. I'll see you in the next one. Peace out and subscribe. What's going on everybody? Welcome. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the switch statement in C++. And if you've been watching from the beginning, congratulations on making it through the first 10 episodes. So I knew you could do it. I believed in you. Honestly, though, I didn't think you'd get this far. So congratulations if you did. We're going to continue working on our C++ skills. So with a switch statement, you will give it an expression or a variable, and it will do different things depending on what the value of that variable is. This is similar to the way an if statement works with the different else if branches, allowing you to do different things, and these all evaluate to true or false. The difference is that instead of using true or false, we're going to use different values. So you might have one, two, and three. So this is very nice when you're working with something that's going to have a very clear numeric output. So if you have a menu, choose an option, one, two, or three, hey, this would be a good time to use a switch statement. You can do pretty much everything, I think everything that you can do with a switch statement using a basic 
if statement. However, this switch might give you a nicer syntax or you might be more comfortable with its setup. So in certain situations, you might prefer to use a switch statement. You should also know how they work if you run into them in the wild. So that was a lot of theoretical junk. Let's just go through an example. This is some of the code that we've been working with from previous videos. And we are checking if the user wants to play a game. They say yes, and when they say yes, we will then ask them what difficulty we want the game to be at. What I want to do is I want to focus on this section here. So they answer, they say what difficulty. Let's go ahead and create a switch statement to do different things depending on what difficulty they choose. You can see we have a similar structure to that here, but we are actually going to replace this with a switch statement. So to do this, we can first output what difficulty they chose. You chose difficulty got these arrows the wrong direction. And we will just then say difficulty and an end L. Then we will say switch. And inside of parentheses, you are going to put some expression or variable. We will use difficulty. And then we will define a set of curly braces. Now when you do this, you might get an error because of the type of difficulty. It requires an integer type. So right now, difficulty is a string and we are typing in easy, medium, or hard. Now, of course, you could correlate these to some number in code, but what might be easier is to actually make a menu where they can type 0, 1, 2, 3, whatever it might be. So in that situation, what I want to do is I actually want to change this from string to an integer. And now, where we ask them easy, medium, hard, we can give them numeric options. So we can say 0 is easy, and then we will do a backslash n and say 1, is medium, a backslash n, and then two is hard. And then after hard, we will, uh, let's just go ahead and remove these parentheses. It doesn't really make sense in this case. So we'll just say what difficulty, and then on a new line, we'll say zero, one, and two. And then afterwards, we will just create a new line. So this is a little hard to read. Let's go ahead and just test to make sure it works the way I'm thinking. And then I might just rearrange how we actually have the code so it's a little bit easier to read. Do you want to play a game? Yes. Have you beat the game? No. What difficulty? Zero, one, and two. So it looks nice here. However, if you don't like having code that looks like this, what you could do is you could just break this out into multiple statements. So we'll have one C out here and then we will create a new C out on the next line. And you can have as many as you want, whatever makes it easiest to see. So let's go ahead and put easy in one C out, and we'll do another one for medium, and then a final one for hard. So two is hard, and that should turn out to look exactly the same way, but it's a lot easier to read in our code. Yes, I want to play a game. No, I haven't beat it, and it works. Great. So now that we are getting an integer as an input, the switch statement is no longer complaining, and inside of the switch we can have different cases for whatever they've said. So if the case is zero, that means they said that they want it on easy. And you'll put a colon, and this is going to be considered easy, Inside of the case, I want you to say break. Each case is going to have a break statement, and I'll explain why in a moment. So we'll have case 0, case 1, case 2. And then you can also have a default case, which is everything else. And we will include the break for that as well. Before the break, you can put any custom code that you want. So this is similar to within the curly braces of an if statement, but we don't actually have to have the curly braces. So we could say, see out, you chose easy. So in this situation, it'll only say that if the user chose zero, which is easy. The break will actually jump out of the switch statement and go to the next line. If you don't have the break, it'll fall through and execute any of the other code in these other cases. It's a strange behavior, but it's the thing that you should definitely be familiar with. So let's do something very similar for these other cases. For case one, we will do medium. And then for case two, we will say you chose 
hard. And then the default case, basically, if they said some number we're not familiar with, we can just say that we don't understand, or just something like, bro, what? Whatever you want. Let's go ahead and try this out. Yes, I want to play a game. No, I have not beat it. And we will choose one for medium. And it says you chose difficulty one. You chose medium. So it looks like I have two print statements here. We can just remove this version since it's an integer. We don't want to uh, print that. Let's go ahead and try it again. This time, let's put a different number. I'm just going to fill out these comments if it's uh, helpful. Let's try a number that doesn't exist in this list. Yes, no, I have not beat the game, and then I will say five. Then it says, bro, what? So that is how the default case works. And then the last thing I wanted to show you is if we forget to put the break, what happens? And this is an interesting way of having the same thing happen for case one and case two. So if you just removed this two, now if you type one or two, this is going to happen. So in certain situations, you might not want to put that break if you want to group a few different cases together like that. Or if there's a scenario where you want to do this code for case one and two, but you want to do a little bit extra for case one, you can do that as well. So let me show you that. Uh, and generally, you're always going to have the break, but you can kind of manipulate the functionality if you are trying to do something strange. But let's try this now and we will go with medium. You can see it says you chose medium, you chose hard. So basically this was executed and then because we didn't have a break, it went down to this next section and then it stopped at this break. So it'll just continue to execute the different sections until a break is hit. That is your introduction to switch statements. Hopefully that was helpful. I'll usually use switch statements if I'm displaying some menu with clear numeric options but overall, I tend to prefer if statements. Now you can have expressions in here. So for example, difficulty plus five, obviously that's going to throw all of our numbers off, but that evaluates to an integer. So this will compile and run, but you can't use other data types in here. It needs to be a numeric type or char, which is directly correlated to integers. So that is your switch crash course. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next episode. Welcome everybody. In this episode, we're going to learn how to create our own custom function. This is going to allow us to extract some section of code, invoke it by name, and we can do that multiple times. If we ever need to change that code, we only have to change it in one location versus throughout all of the code. So this is a really good way to improve the quality of your code, reduce typing, and yeah, you just, you just do this when you're programming. So we're gonna learn how to create functions. So let's say you had some structure for your code and you wanted to keep it pretty much the same, but you wanted to basically say, hey, once you choose a difficulty, just play the game. So let's go ahead and condense these cases. It's going to be the same, regardless if it's easy, medium, or hard. What we will do is we will just say case zero, one, or two, which is easy, medium, or hard. And in here, we could just say play game and then break. So we basically extract the entire game functionality and call it by this name. And you could do something similar if you wanted to have like an impossible mode that was very, very difficult and you had to have beaten the game at least one time. You can ask, hey, have you beat the game? And if yes, if beat game is true, we can do the same exact thing here play game. Without the ability to invoke a function like that, we would have to copy this behavior two times. So now we can define play game in a single location and then invoke that anywhere we want. A few other changes is first we're not going to have to require them to enter some secret passcode. So we can just remove this line here. So it'll just assume in this situation, they will want to play impossible mode. We'll say play game and later we can possibly pass in like a difficulty or something like that. We'll talk about those options. The other thing is after this is done, it's going to just continue on with this code and ask them what difficulty they want, which doesn't make sense if they're already playing the game. So you have the option to say, return zero here, basically copying that final uh, code down here. You also need that system pause if you don't want it to just automatically close. 
the other option would be to just use an else here. So we can say else, and then we will surround everything else in curly braces. So it'll look like this. And then I'll just go in here and indent everything inside of these curly braces. So I think that is right. The only problem now is that this function we're calling play game, it doesn't yet exist. So we're going to define it. So oftentimes you will see it set up this way where you have a function prototype void play game. It'll look like this. Now I'm going to show you a different way I prefer, but for now you will just say what the name of the function is and its return type, in this case void, meaning we're not going to return any data back to the user. Or I guess instead of user, I should say the developer. So the person who is invoking this function, they're not going to get any data back. So after main, you can scroll down to the bottom, that's where we're going to put the function definition. So we'll say void play game, and this will actually have the implementation. So you're going to have the curly braces. And just to check that this works, we will say C out playing game dot 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 new line end quote semicolon. So let's test this out. We will play. Do you want to play a game? Yes. Have you beat the game? Yes. Because you beat the game, you can play in possible mode. Playing game. So you can see it actually did make it down here to this function call and output it that. Let's go ahead and try it again, this time not on the impossible mode setting. So have you beat the game? No. We will go for medium and it says playing game. So either one plays the game. We don't have any way to configure difficulty or anything yet, but this is a start. Now. I think having the the prototype at the top and the definition at the bottom is kind of redundant when you're just doing everything in a single file like this. So what I'll tend to do is cut that and bring it all the way to the top where we have the prototype and just replace the prototype with the definition itself. And in this situation, the definition acts as the prototype and the implementation. So this should work just the same. You can run the code. And it works. Yes, I want to play. No, I have not beat the game. And I want to play on easy. Cool. You can also see that we're kind of taking advantage of that fall through capability of the switch, where we're basically doing the same exact thing for easy, medium, and hard. You could, of course, go in here and do different things for easy, medium, and hard. That's totally up to you. Now, I want to talk about arguments, which is going to be the focus of the next video, because right now we have no way to pass in some kind of difficulty. When you extract functionality into functions, you'll often need to pass in data known as arguments. So that's what we're going to be talking about, as well as return data in the following episode. If you've enjoyed this content so far, please be sure to give that subscribe button a little slap. Pew, pew, pew and check out the next episode. Hey everybody, in this episode, we're gonna talk about arguments. You know, you and your girl, you're getting in a fight. Nah, not those kind of arguments. We're talking about passing data to a function. Much more exciting. So this is how you can make a function that will work in multiple scenarios. So it's not just gonna do the same thing every single time. You know, you might want that function to be able to do two different things or multiple different things. We're also going to be talking about return data. Sometimes that function is going to do something for us and give us back a result. Also, look at this reflection. It's pretty. It's purple. You may hear of the concept of a black box in software development, and this is commonly used when you're discussing functions. So if you imagine the function as a box, and it's black so you can't see what's happening inside. It's completely opaque. This function does something, but it will often require inputs and give back outputs. And you don't actually have to understand every detail of what's going on on the inside of the box. All you need to understand is what happens when you give it a certain input, what's the output you should expect. If you can test that function enough, 
then you can just see it as a puzzle piece that you can just bring into your code and use whenever you need that functionality. If you keep building on this principle and you start collecting a bunch of useful functions, you can now have a function library. And this is going to allow you to write software a whole lot easier because your code is now just going to be much smaller, a bunch of function calls. You don't really need to understand every detail of them, but you get generally how they work and your overall code readability is improved. Your testing ability is improved because you can isolate different functionality to test and it's just a highly recommended approach. So let's go ahead and start building out a game so you can see right now we're not really doing anything. What kind of game do you want to play? You want to make something simple like Call of Duty? I think I'll go with something like a guessing game. You can imagine the user playing the game for some period of time and then let's say they actually beat the game. You could return true or false. True if they won the game and false if they lost the game. This is the return data. And because true has a type, it's of type boolean, you're going to go up here and change void to bool. I know I said I was going to start with arguments, but the concept of a return is fairly simple, so I figured I'd show that. And now what we can do is we can actually start building functionality. So we will just say a correct number is 42. Later on, we'll talk about how to generate this in the next episode, so that way it's truly pseudo random number anyways and what we'll do now is say guess a number and we'll give them a certain number of guesses so let's say you get and we'll have a variable guesses and then we'll just use the string guesses so it'll tell them how many guesses that they get to guess the number but where does guesses come from this is where we can use an argument so we might want to be able to play this game with five guesses ten guesses and we can customize that whenever we call this function by passing it in to this parameter here so this is a variable of type int called guesses so notice we don't say what that value is anywhere in this function we say what that value is when we call the function and then all we will need to do is say int guess and we'll get a value for that. If guess is correct, then they win. And in that situation, we will return true. So that's where that return true is going to come in. And otherwise we can return false. Now notice you don't have to use else here because in any scenario that you reach this line, it's going to be false. However, else is not going to hurt anything. So now when we invoke play game, we can pass a number to it, such as down here, and we'll say play game with one guess. And that's because it's impossible mode. Down where we have multiple difficulties, we'll just assume that they get five guesses. Or maybe it would be appropriate to break this out into different difficulties. So case zero being easy, we can say play a game and we'll say 10 guesses. And then for medium, that's where we can say five. Play a game, five guesses. And then lastly, hard is going to be three guesses. Now, how do we actually know if they won the game? Well, first off, you're going to want to break after each one of these, so that way it doesn't go to the next section of code. And since this is returning data, we can assign it to something. So we can say one is equal to play game. And we're gonna do that same exact thing. The way this will evaluate is the function call will happen first. This will be ran. It'll evaluate to true or false, and then that value will be assigned to 1, which we can define up here. Or because we're going to be doing something very similar with the impossible mode, we could actually define 1 to be here, bool 1, and we will assign it here as well. So that's how we can check if they've won, and down after all of these calls and you can follow these lines up if you get lost so this is if they've beat the game before so one higher if the response is why after all of this code but not outside of that curly brace we can say if one and inside of here see out congrats you won else see out try again later I'm going to go ahead and add a new line here as well. So let's test this out. Now, just to warn you, we don't actually have 
the loop functionality in here to play multiple guesses. We're going to talk about that probably in the next episode. But for now, we can still simulate this with the code we have. So we'll run this, make sure we don't have any errors or issues. Do you want to play a game? Yes. Let's play a game then. Have you beat the game? We'll say no. We'll go with medium difficulty. Guess the number, you get five guesses. So notice how that value was generalized here and it's passed in and it worked. So five guesses. That comes from down here. Play game five. Cool. So we'll guess the number. 42. Congrats, you won. Let's try it again. We'll just try a few times to make sure we get the idea. Yes. And yes, I've beat the game. Because you beat the game, you can play impossible mode. Guess the number, you get one guess. We'll say 40. And it says try again later. Or maybe you want to say, like, you lost or something. Because it makes it sound like it's broken. You lost. That is your introduction to arguments and return data. Stay tuned for the next video where we're actually going to finish the game functionality. It's a little bit more of a jump up in content difficulty, so it might be actually built out over the next two videos. But by the end of that, you'll have an idea about how to use loops as well as random numbers, and it should be pretty good practice. So hopefully this video has been helpful, fun, and I'll see you in the next video. What's going on everybody? This video we are going to continue building our little guessing game. So this is actually going to be a video on two real topics. The first being creating a guessing game and the second being loops. So we're going to be using a while loop which we haven't talked about yet. And basically if you want something to happen multiple times that's where a loop is going to come in. So not only do we want them to guess a number once, but we want them to be able to guess it multiple times depending on how many guesses they have. So to do this, after we define the correct answer, and we'll talk about getting a random number here soon, probably in the next video, but for now we are going to assume that is a random number just to check the functionality of the game. So like many structures, we will start with parentheses and then curly braces. Now I'm going to take this closing curly brace and move it to after all of the other code. I don't want the return false inside of the curly brace. So basically if they've guessed it multiple times in the loop and they end up running out of attempts, then we will return false. Now inside of the parentheses, we will have an expression that evaluates to true or false, very similar to an if statement, but this section inside of the parentheses will execute every single time as long as that expression evaluates to true. So what we'll do is we'll say guess count and we will keep track of this. We'll just define it to start with zero. So int guess count is zero. And while this number is less than guesses, we will execute this code. Now this looks pretty good. However, there is a really big problem, but let's go ahead and run it and see what happens. Do you want to play a game? Yes. Have you beat the game? Doesn't matter. Let's go with yes. It says we get one guess. We guess it. We get it wrong. Oh, but you can see we continually can guess for the correct number. It has no concept of progressing towards the completion of the loop. This is kind of a bad example because we only are supposed to have one guess. But if we went through this again with, say, five guesses, in this situation, it should count down. So you have five guesses, we guess a number, and it should say you get four guesses, and keep doing that until we run out of guesses. So we've come pretty far, but there's one more thing we have to do, and that is increment or increase the guess count by one. So you can do that with plus plus. That'll take whatever guess count is and add one to it. You can think of it as guess count is assigned guess count plus one. This will evaluate to some value and then be reassigned to the original guess count. It's just a shorthand way of doing that and it's uh, pretty common so you should get used to this syntax. Which actually, quick note, you can also do guess count plus equals one. That'll increment it by one as well. This gives you more flexibility to increase it by any amount. But 
still the plus plus is most common. That's what we're most likely going to be doing for this example. After we increment guess count, we can output how many times they've guessed. So you've guessed, close the parentheses, guess count, forgot a less than symbol, and then times. And we'll just put a new line there and end the quote. This one up here where it says you get guesses, guesses, we can just take this line and move it outside of the loop because we don't need to say that every single time. We only need to tell them how many guesses they have once. So this is just a better setup. Let's run this and test it out. Do you wanna play? Yes. Have you beat the game? No. Medium gives us five guesses. Guess the number, four. You've guessed one time. Three, you've guessed two times, 70. Three times, 50, four times, and then six. And the game ends. At any time, if we get the correct answer, it should stop. Let's try it out. We will go for the same setup. So no, we have not beat the game and we want medium. Let's go ahead and get it wrong a few times and then we'll get it correct, 42. And it says, congrats, you won. That's because it returns true, which breaks out of this function and goes back to the main code. At this point, you should have a decent understanding of how the while loop works, but I wanted to share a system that I've used that has always helped me make sure I get all of the pieces right. And that is the phrase, I see you. So these are the three pieces of a loop. You will have the initialization, the comparison or condition, and the update. Basically, if you think about those in less technical terms, where are we starting, where are we ending, and how are we getting from the start position to the end position? In this case, we initialize to zero, we compare guess count to guesses, and then we update guess count by one. When you learn about other loop structures, such as the for loop, the concept is going to be very similar. The syntax is just going to be a little different. So if you don't have any of these things, it's not going to work the way you expect. The most common problem is forgetting that update so you never actually move closer to the finish line. Or if the condition will never be true, the loop will never run. Or if the condition is always true, such as greater than or equal to zero, which by the way, this is how you say greater than or equal to, and zero, it doesn't matter what guess count is in this situation, we still have an infinite loop because we start at zero, so it's already true. And as we increment guess count, it's still going to always be true, which I wanted to give you a quick tip because I am assuming many of you watching this managed to mess something up. And you created an infinite loop that is executing very quickly. If, for example, you do not have a console in, and you have some condition or a messed up update, you will have some terminal spam where when we play this, you can see it's just, it's just doing its thing. It's gonna just end up probably crashing your computer at some point. The trick to get out of this is control C. So hold control, hit C, it'll close out of that, and you're good to go. That is the fundamentals of the guessing game. In the next video, we're going to talk about how we actually generate a random number so that this is a game we can actually play. Right now, we know the number, so it's not very fun. It might be fun to go show our friend, or I mean, if you have any friends. <laughs> it might be fun to show this to somebody else, but it's not gonna be very fun if we can't play it ourselves. So let's go ahead and update this code to include a random number. Check out the next episode and be sure to subscribe. Hey, what's going on everybody? I bet you can't guess what we're gonna talk about today. Yeah, we're gonna continue our guessing game. All right, I had to throw in one of them stupid cringy jokes just to make your ears bleed and your soul die inside. But now that I got that out of the way, we can start by learning about random numbers. So the concept of random is quite interesting because many things in computers seem random, but they're actually not random. And this is known as pseudo random. So if we can basically feed in enough inputs to some number generator so that it just generates a random number that makes it very hard to predict that number, 
that is probably close enough to random for most use cases. So that's what we're going to be doing. And the thing that's going to basically feed or input to generate that random number is going to be the system clock. Since the time is always changing, it acts as a good seed for our random number generator. So the very first thing we're going to do is include, and we're going to include C standard lib. This is going to introduce some of the capabilities needed for random numbers. To get a random number inside of play game, we can output playing game, and we need to do something to generate a value here. To do this, you will invoke rand. So let's run this real quick, see what happens. Also, before we do that, I need to uncomment that, that I messed up in the previous video. And before we run it, what I wanna do is actually output the correct answer so we can see it. Since it's no longer hard coded, it's kind of difficult. So we'll say C out, correct, and L. Hit play. And you can see the generated number is 130. Let's try this again. This time it is, oh, what, 130? Yeah, that doesn't seem very random. What's going on? Well, that's because we never seeded, which is introducing some value to base the random number generation off of. And the way you do this is before you generate the random number, you say srand and pass in some seed value, which we are going to get from time. And this takes some argument. I actually am unsure what the argument is, but you can pass in null and that works just fine. So this is basically saying, hey, we want to see this random number from our system time. So let's go ahead and just see what time does. And we'll pass null in here. Let's try it now. So we will play this on any difficulty. Here is the time. And that is used to seed for a random number now. So we have 5595. When we run it again, most likely that's going to be a different number. And you can see it is 2576. So this is kind of difficult. You know, how are you going to guess that number with only five guesses? Even I would have a hard time getting that in five guesses. So I can't even imagine how difficult it would be for you guys. So what we're going to do is we're going to figure out how to take that random number and reduce it to a smaller number, but we still want it to be at least somewhat random. It's not going to be perfect, but it's going to be close enough. And that is to use the modulus operator. The modulus operator is going to do some division on that number and take the remainder. So we could divide it by a smaller number. The smaller that number, the smaller the possible remainder. So we're no longer going to need to print that. Just wanted to show you that for demonstration purposes. And to use the modulus operator, you use the percent sign. You might also hear modulo. And let's say you wanted 20 possibilities. You could use zero through 19. To do that, you would put 20. So if you imagine for a moment, the random number generated was 60, you divide that by 20, that's going to go into that perfectly three times. So you're gonna have a remainder of zero. So that is a possible value that could be outputted. If instead you had a random number of 61, 20 is going to go into that three times with one left over because it's going to use integer division. So no fractional numbers. So 20, 40, 60, one left over. You'll never get that remainder of 20 because you're dividing by 20. So that would just increase the result of the division, not the remainder. If you have modulo 20 or modulus operator of 20, you can get the possible outputs of zero through 19. So if you had say 79, you would get 20, 40, 60, 19 left over. If you had 80, then you'd get 20, 40, 60, 80, zero left over. This is not perfect because it's not going to have an even distribution of output and numbers. You can look into this concept more, but for our purpose, it's going to get the job done because the user is not going to be able to easily predict which numbers are most common. But in theory, if you ran this software and you wrote down every single random number, certain ones are going to be showing up more just based on the result of the different divisions. So in this situation, if you had modulus of three, you're trying to grab a number zero, one, or two, zero is going to show up four out of the 11 times. 
and that random number max is 10. So basically you're going to take 10, divide it by three and see what the remainder is. Four out of the 11 times, because zero is included, it's going to give zero. So zero, three, six, and nine. Similarly for one, four, seven, and 10, it's going to be four out of the 11. And then for two, five, and eight, three out of the 11. So two is a result that's going to only show up three out of 11 times instead of four out of every 11. It's kind of a simple concept, but also kind of challenging to think about and wrap your mind around if you're not super comfortable with uh, division and math and remainders. So sometimes I'll even have to think through this, you know, make sure I'm getting the right range of numbers. But let's try this. We'll run and we have five guesses. The answer is 16. So you can see now that's a much more reasonable number to ask the user to guess. Now, if you want a little challenge, make it so that it'll tell the user if their guess was too high or too low if they get it wrong. Go ahead and pause because I'm gonna show you how to do that now. We will check where the guess is correct and we can add an else if and check to see if guess is less than correct in which we can say see out too low mate i also have not been super consistent about how i space out my if statements so i apologize if i've introduced any confusion and then we can just have an else we don't need an else if because there's no other possibility if it's not equal to it and it's not less than it it must be greater than it. So we'll say C out too high mate. And this will give people at least some direction. You could also tell them what the highest and lowest possible numbers are if you wish to do that. But let's try this now. So we will guess, you can see the answer is two. Eventually you're gonna remove that. You're not gonna leave that in the final product. It will say zero, too low mate. Four, too high. One, it's too low. Three, and then finally two. And just to throw some variation into this, we're going to change things if it's in possible mode. So if it's in possible mode, we're going to make that max number way higher. So to do this, we don't actually need to change the calling code. So down here where we have play game one, we can leave that the same. And we can just change the function to check how many guesses. So if the guess is passed in was one, we know it's in possible mode. If guesses is one, what are we going to do? We will define a different value for correct where it's going to be rand but modulo 200 instead. Now, because we're doing it this way, what we're going to want to do is define correct up here like so, but then initialize it later. So we're not going to redeclare it here. Now, obviously the arrangement here is kind of bad. Apologies, it wasn't really looking. So we want the seating to be up here and then this option to be within an else. So it'll look like this. Take this line and we will move that here. There we go. So now it's one or the other. Let's test it out. Make sure both options work. Have you beat the game? Yes. You get one guess. You can see the random number generated was 186. Let's try it again with it being set to something like medium. So you can see it generated nine. Now, that's not necessarily a perfect test because, you know, it could have just by chance generated nine, but I'm pretty confident in this code here. Not so confident that I would uh, bet my life on it, but I think it's pretty decent for what we're trying to do. So this video was a little bit longer, but hopefully it was fun. In the next video, we're going to be talking about some new stuff. We're going to start from scratch. So I'm really excited for that. Stay tuned and I'll see you in the next video. Peace out. Welcome everybody. In this episode, we are going to start talking about multiple files being compiled down to a single program that can be executed as one. This is very important because as you get larger and larger projects, you're not just going to work with a single file. It would get very unorganized and pretty much impossible to build complex applications. So we're going to learn how to break out some of our content into separate files. So we are going to refactor some of our code, which is a word that means change the code without changing any of the functionality. This is usually done when you want to clean up your code 
and make the overall maintenance of the project easier, but you want everything to work the same. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this play game function and move it to a separate file. If you think of play game as a black box where you just pass it some guesses and the game will be played, then you don't need to have all of the details of the code in line here in this same file. Instead we can move it to a separate file and we'll move that out of our brain storage since we only have so much local temporary storage in our brain. Think of it as like our RAM for our brain. So let's just get that out of here. So what we'll do is we will go into our project explorer here and you can expand this and see what we have so far. When you right click on your project you can say add or add new and there's this option for a unit. This is what we'll end up using, but I wanna show you one thing real quick. If you go to other and then individual files, you can see that we have the option for a CPP file or a C++ file, and then a unit, which is the CPP file and a header file. So the unit is basically going to create both of these, and when you split things out into multiple files in C++, you're often going to have paired two files, the C++ file and the header file. The header file acts as basically a description of what things are going to be able to be done with the C++ file. Think of it as the interface or the prototypes for the C++ code, but no actual execution. And then the C++ file is going to have that execution. The header file is what we'll actually import into our code. So with that blabbering out of the way, let's go ahead and click a unit here. Click OK. It's going to generate some code and you can see it's called unit1.cpp. We can save. We can name this something such as game, save it, and that'll change the include as well here. Now in our project, you'll see we have the game.cpp and inside of that, that's actually two files. So the C++ file and the header file. What we're currently looking at is this one here. There's also the header file, which looks like this. Now, if you're following along and you're not using C++ Builder, then you'll just need to create the game.cpp file for C++ and then the game.h file. What do you actually put in them? Well, it's going to look like this. For the header file, I would recommend copying it like so. You don't need these comment lines, so we can get rid of those. So it'll just look like this. And here is where we're actually going to type our code. Basically what this does is if you import game.h multiple times, it'll prevent that from happening. So if not defined game h, then we're going to define it. And then we will end the if. This is that directive syntax similar to what we have over here in the include. So it's a little bit different but that is how you basically say, hey, if we've already imported game.h, don't do it again. Now, that's the header file. As for the game.c++ file, let's go ahead and open that. This is going to have some stuff generated with C++ Builder. I'm going to remove this stuff. With the exception, it is best practice here to include that header file. And when we're including one of our custom files, we will put it in quotes. So we will say game.h. Now we can actually jump between these two files using these tabs down here, which is kind of nice. What we'll do is we will define our function prototypes here inside of this file. And what that will look like is if you go back to our code that we have our function, it's going to be this piece right here. So we will copy that and bring that over to the header file, pasting that here with the semicolon. And then the entire function is what we will put inside of the C++ file for game. So game.cpp, paste that here. Now inside of youtube.cpp or whatever your main, whatever the file that contains your main function is called, go ahead and just delete that function. So we will delete that here, make sure I get all that removed. And we will just need to include that header file. So include and inside of quotes, game.h. Now one other problem is that Anytime we are using namespace standard, this is going to be required for every single file. So inside a game.cpp, you can see we have C out, but there is no using namespace standard. So you could go ahead and prefix everything with STD, or you could just take this line, copy it, 
and bring that over to this file as well. So after we have that include, we will say using namespace standard. Additionally, we will need to include any things that are in this file. So we would say include IO stream, include string in our case, and include, I think it was C standard lib. So these are the same as this over here. You can remove the ones you're not using anymore over in this file, but I think we're still using IO stream and string, so we'll keep those. And now in theory, I should be able to run and see if we forgot anything else. And it compiles and runs. Yes, I wanna play a game. No, I have not beat the game, and we'll choose a medium difficulty. And you can see we're still outputting <laughs> that the, the correct answer. So that's kind of off topic from this video, but if you're building this game, you'll not want to do that. So remove that line. So hopefully that was helpful. As you can probably see, it's a little bit of a setup, but when you figure this process out, you can simplify your main project code and you can just have this function library containing everything important. So this video hasn't had the instructions to do multi-file compilation if you're not using C++ Builder. So if that's your case, I have another C++ series where we've done something similar. So you can look that up on my channel. That's if you're using G++. And we also talk about make files, which can make things easier, but definitely not as easy as using an IDE where you just hit the play button and you're good to go. Thank you so much for watching and stay tuned for the next episode where we're going to modify some of our code to learn about different loop structures. Thank you, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace out. Hey, everybody, welcome. This video, we are going to be learning about for loops. So we've talked about while loops, and now we're basically going to take a while loop we already have and convert that to a for loop, calling out some key important things. Overall, this video shouldn't be too bad once you understand while loops, so it shouldn't take too long to go through this material. So we have been working on this play game function, which is basically a guessing game where it checks if your guess count is less than guesses. So the guesses is passed in, showing how many you're allowed to guess. And I mentioned when we were talking about while loops, there's three important components, which is initialization, and then some condition or comparison, whichever is easier to remember, condition. So that needs to evaluate to true for this loop to run. And then at the end of the loop, typically the last thing or close to the last thing, we will have this here, which is the update. And this is how we progress to the end of the loop. Now a while loop is very handy because I can move this guess count plus plus around. So in this situation, you can see we're incrementing it before we are outputting it. If we did the increment at the very end, it's going to change what that output is. So while loops give you a little bit more functionality and flexibility as to when we increment or update values. A for loop, although very similar, has a very consistent structure across all for loops. So let's talk about what that for loop is going to look like. What we will do is we will keep the while loop here and scoot it down and we'll say four. Now the structure, the, the syntax here is going to look very similar to start with, but it's going to change pretty quickly because we're going to actually put three different things inside of these parentheses. The first thing is the initialization. So what we can do is we can say int guess count and set that to zero. So notice this is the exact same line as this one here. So we will remove that. The next thing is we are going to put some condition. So after a semicolon, we will say guess count is less than guesses. Hmm, that looks very similar to this line right here. So let's just go ahead and remove this. And what we can do then is basically use the original body from the while loop for the for loop. The last thing that we're going to do is have the update, which is going to be guess count plus plus. Hmm, that looks very similar to what we have down here. So you can see it has all of the three same components, but we're just going to define those all at the same spot so we can easily see what is going on. You can know exactly how the loop works just by looking at this single line. You should now be able to run this as is 
However, it's not going to work exactly as you might expect. And I'll explain why, and it has to do with this output here. So if we get to the point where we play this game, and it asks us to guess a number, let's say we guess 5, it says you've guessed 0 times. If you remember from the while loop, we incremented before we outputted that value. So now, this doesn't happen until after. So the exact breakdown is this statement here happens only once at the beginning. Then, before each iteration, so in order for the entire body to be executed, this must evaluate to true. This statement does not happen until after the body is executed. The functionality is all exactly the same, the difference is just the output. So, what we can do is we can just modify this output to guess count plus one. Since it's being printed right before the guess count is incremented, we can just change the display. So let's run this, make sure I'm not totally crazy, and let me hop through the menus just to get the game playing. You get five guesses, we'll go with four, too low, let's try. 16, too high, we'll split that in the middle somewhere, let's say 10. Congrats, I won, awesome. So I was actually kind of expecting to run out of guesses. Let's just make sure that's functioning correctly, which it should be. Do you want to play a game? All right, so we have five guesses. I'm just going to say one, four, five times, and it stops. So you can see the loop works exactly the same way, but in my opinion, it's a much better structure. I like to have all of those pieces of a loop up front. One more variation that you can do is instead of starting at zero and then outputting guess count plus one, you can just start out at one and just change the comparison or the condition. For that, we will say guess count starts out at one. We will remove this and then say less than or equal to guesses. This should run the same way. So in this situation, we can guess three, four, five times and you can see it still works. And the output looks right each time. So we will talk about some variations and just some important notes about how we set this up in the next video. My personal preference is to keep it starting at zero. So I'm going to go with zero and then guess count plus one. We'll talk about why in more detail in the next video and some of the upcoming episodes when we start talking about arrays. My general preference is when I have a certain number of times a thing is going to happen, I prefer a for loop. If I have something that's going to run indefinitely, I prefer a while loop. Although you can often use either loop for whatever usage, it just makes sense for me to use a for loop when I'm starting at some number and incrementing until we stop at some number. Where a while loop, I'll usually use if it's something like while true and then breaking out of that loop later on at some point. So in the next video, we're gonna talk about how to create a for loop that counts down you could use that in this example. So instead of counting how many times they've guessed, you could count how many guesses they have left. If you want a challenge, you can try to build that now and check out the next video for the solution. Thank you for watching and be sure to subscribe. I'll see you in the next one. What's going on everybody? This video we're going to be talking about a for loop that counts down instead of counts up. It's not crazy different. The only difference is that you'll need to change the condition and you'll need to change the update so that you're decrementing instead of incrementing. And you can do all kinds of different variations. You can work with multiple variables or you could increase or decrease a variable by two and essentially skip every other one or any other possible variations. We're not gonna talk about all of them, but we are going to talk about counting down in this video. Let's first take a look at a basic for loop and make sure we understand what's going on. We start with some value zero. We compare it to some ending. This, In this case, that ending is guesses, which is passed in. Guess count plus plus is how we get closer to that value. But as long as guess count is less than guesses, it will continue to run this loop. Inside the loop, we have them guess a number, check if that number is the correct answer. If it is, we return true, which just ends the loop and the entire function. Otherwise, we say too low or too high and output how many times they've guessed. Now we're saying guess count plus one because we're starting guess count at zero, which is an important thing to kind of understand. You don't have to start guess count at zero. You could just start it at one, but 
usually for loops will start at zero. It's just good to become familiar with that structure. And this is closely tied with the indexes of an array, which is index starting at zero. So if you have an array of five elements, you'll do index zero, one, two, three, and four. So for me, I just typically start at zero. It's easier to do that way when you're so used to doing it that way for multiple scenarios in programming. I think when you're first getting started, it's a little bit confusing, but I've grown to prefer using just the less than operator and not so much the less than or equal to operator because it's very easy to mess up your calculations and go one too far or one too short. So for example, if we started this at one and then we had guess count down here just being displayed normally, but we forgot to do less than or equals to, then this is not going to run the correct number of times. So when it comes to testing, what is often done to get a good test coverage is you will test the edge cases. If you have a range of possibilities, you'll often want to test the beginning and the end, as well as what happens right before the end or one past that end. That's where things tend to go wrong. So if I was to test this function, either with some automated testing or just manually, I would want to make sure that we actually get the correct number of tests. We don't get one extra or one too little. But I'm kind of getting off topic, so let's get back to the focus of this video, which was decrementing. So what we will do is, instead of starting guess count at one, we will start it at whatever guesses is. So let's assume guesses, we get five guesses, we're going to basically set guess count to five and then start counting down. Now I don't like the name of this anymore because it doesn't really say what, what it is. It's not the guess count. Instead, it might be something like guesses left. And then we'll say guesses left being greater than, and instead of comparing it to guesses, we'll say zero. So as long as we have more than zero guesses left, we will continue to run this code. But if we leave it at so, it's not going to work. For one, we would need to change this to guesses left and we would want to decrement it. Now, that's a little bit better. And I have a typo here, so let's go ahead and fix that. So this all looks good. Now we just need to change the output. So first, we're not gonna say you've guessed Guess, guesses left, that doesn't make sense. So we'll change this to guesses left and we'll say you have guesses left and then we'll literally just say guesses left. So right now it's not, it's not quite there because I'll show you here what actually happens. I'll move this over so you can see the code. So when we play this game, you get five guesses, we guess a number, and it says you have five guesses left. This is a similar problem to what we faced when we were incrementing in, in the previous video. Since the decrement doesn't happen until after this output, I would just say guesses left minus one. So now that we have that minus one, let's test this out. So we have five guesses, we guess a number, and it says too low, and then you have four guesses left three guesses left, two guesses left, one guess left, and then it ends. So it appears to be working. Now, just like I mentioned with incrementing, you can change the way you set this up and still get the same functionality. You can do that here. So if you didn't want to do guesses left minus one for some reason, you could say guesses left is guesses minus one, and then guesses left greater than or equal to zero. And in this situation, we basically just shifted it over one and now we guess a number. It still says you have four guesses left. Three, two, one, and then it ends. So either one works, but again, I don't like this as much because on that first run, we're going to have guesses left set to four, even though we haven't actually completed the guess yet. So to me, I don't really like this setup. I'm kind of weird and picky and I'm kind of getting into my personal preference. This isn't by any means the only way to do it. 
I have just grown to always be shifted over one when we're incrementing, so starting at zero. And then if I'm decrementing, I like to use the actual number not shifted over one. So having five guesses left, four, three, two, and one. Maybe I'm just inconsistent and an idiot, but that's just the way I've grown to prefer it. But honestly, I'm just splitting hairs at this point. You can do it either way, whatever. Just try to make sure your loops work. Check to make sure they run the appropriate number of times, not one too many or one too little. And the primary reason when incrementing, I've grown to like just starting at zero, as mentioned before, is because often with loops, you're going through an array and arrays are indexed at zero. We haven't talked about arrays, but this would be the perfect time to transition into content on arrays, which is actually what we're gonna be doing in the next video. And this, we're going to start a completely new project. So we're done with this guessing game for now, probably not going to work on it anymore in this series. So we're going to start something new, which is the whole idea of having multiple items in an array, or you can think of it as a list. Let's say you wanted to make a shopping list or keep track of foods you've eaten or whatever it might be where you wanna keep track of multiple things, that's where an array is going to come in. We're gonna talk about how to do loops for arrays, all kinds of cool things. So thank you so much for watching up until this point. Definitely encourage you to stick through the rest of the series, get some more practice. Things are gonna be fun. The next app we're making is cool, so stay tuned. I'll see you in the next one. Peace out. Hey, welcome everybody. This episode, we're gonna talk about arrays and we're actually going to be creating a new project. So we're going to create arrays to keep track of basically a list of food. And ultimately we will include the price of the food. And this will allow us to basically keep track of, imagine this being a receipt. You can keep track of all the foods you've bought and the cost for those foods. You could then, you know, sum up that value and get your total cost if you wished or do various other things. Now let's get started. We are going to go into our editor and create a new project. So file, new console application and okay. This will create a file one.cpp inside of project two in our case. What we can do is save this and I'm just going to call this foods hit save, that changed the file name, but it doesn't actually change the project. So that will happen when you try to run, it'll ask you to save the project, which I'll also call this foods. So a third save will pop up and basically we're going to name the foods header file and the foods project. So I just named them all the same thing. And as we did with the previous example, I'm just going to start from scratch with an int main and a return zero and then a system pause. Like so. So we will go ahead and include the basic stuff, which will be IO stream in this case. Include IO stream and include string. And we'll say using namespace STD, which we talked about in episode three, I believe. So to create an array, basically what you do is you define what type of data you want to store. So we can say string foods and then square brackets. Here we define how many foods we want to store. Let's go with three. We'll use a semicolon and we can start adding foods to this array. An array you can think of just as a list or a bucket. And I'm also gonna zoom in just a little bit here so we can see better. Or imagine you're going shopping and you have a literal basket with three spots for food. That is essentially what we are building now. This is statically sized, meaning we type the size in hard coded here and it's going to stay that size the entire time. Similar to how variables are statically typed. So this is always going to be a string array of size three. We can add three food elements here by saying foods and then in square brackets using a zero and assigning it a value. It starts with zero, so it's gonna be zero, one, and two to talk about the three different food elements. Element is just a word often used to describe an item inside of an array. Since this is a string array, we will put the quotes and then put some food here, grapes. 
That is how you define the first food element. We will do the same thing for foods of one, and we will say carrots. And then lastly, foods of two. And what food do we want to use? Oh, I don't know. Lemons. So this number passed in the square brackets is known as the index. So this is index zero, index one, and index two. The three up here is not an index, rather it's the size. So when you define the array, you're passing in the size. When you're using the array, you're passing in an index. So foods of zero, you might hear it said, or you might just hear index zero in the foods array is assigned the value grapes. How do we actually print these values? Well, you can say C out, and then just use foods passing in an index such as one, and this should output carrots. So we run this and we get carrots. Great job. You can also change the value of any of these indexes. Foods one, we will assign it chocolate. And now when we run, we should get the output chocolate. So basically we assigned it carrots, but then we replaced that with chocolate. Now I'm gonna talk about an alternative way to assign values to the array, and that is with the initialization. If you're using the terminal, you might need to compile with C++ 11. For us, the play button will work just fine. But basically, if you wanted to say, hey, we want grapes, carrots, and lemons, without having to go through and choose each index, what you can do is you can assign these values up front. So we can actually just pass these in as strings. So we'll say grapes, carrots, and lemons separated by commas. This will allow us to remove these three lines and save a lot of space. Everything should work the same way. So we replace foods one with chocolate. Let's just get rid of that line to make sure this is working. So foods of one should still be carrots. And you see we get carrots. Now this is interesting because it allows us to remove the size over here. The important thing to realize though is that it is still statically sized. It's still size three. It just is able to infer that from the line of code we have here. So now when we run, it still should work exactly the same way. Perfect. Now we've talked about printing. What happens if we do something like foods of 10? Let's see what happens. We run this, we get nothing. This is very dangerous because we're reading data outside of the bounds of the array. Anytime we go out of the bounds of the array, bounds meaning the start and the end in memory, the behavior is unpredictable. We can't say for sure what's going to happen, and this is especially so when we are assigning data. So if we tried to assign to foods of 10, we'll say foods 10 and assign it a value test. This is going to just not work. And you can see that it actually just closed on its own. So the program just crashed. What if we wanted to print every element inside of this array? What we can do is, instead of saying see out foods of 10, we can actually create a loop to print every single element. So we'll say for int i is zero, i is less than three, which is the size of the array, and then i plus plus. Since i is starting at zero, it's going to go zero, one, and two, and then i being less than three is going to be false and it'll stop running. So we don't risk reaching index three because that is outside the bounds of the array. Then inside of the loop, we can output. So we'll say C out foods. And instead of passing in zero, one or two, we can actually use I. So that's going to change each iteration, grabbing a new element. And then we will just say end line. So this should do the trick running this. We get grapes, carrots, lemons. Now real quick, I know this video is going kind of long. I want to talk about another array type. This is an array coming from the standard library. And the way it's going to be set up, instead of saying string foods with the square brackets, you will say array. And inside of these carrots, you will say what type of the array it is, in this case string, and the size of the array, in this case three and then you will just give it a name, so no square brackets. This should work the same way, so we can run this. We're getting an error, and that is actually because we did not include the appropriate include, which is 
array. Now it runs and it works the same way. This has a magical function attached to it that you can invoke. So inside of our for loop, we can say i less than three. Instead of saying less than three, we can actually say foods.size. So this is a function that is attached to it. This is part of object-oriented programming and it's called a method. So a function that is attached to an object is called a method. So the size method will automatically get that value three for us, which allows us to prevent errors or issues running the, our code if we ended up changing the size and forgetting to change all of our loops. It dynamically will get the size for us. So let's run this and you can see it works the same way. And there's actually another loop structure I wanted to teach you guys, and that is going to replace this for loop altogether. You will say for, so it's still using the for keyword, but the syntax is a bit different, where you will say auto food colon foods. So the auto food is going to be a variable that will reference whatever food we are on for that iteration. The auto is the type, and it can be figured out just by analyzing the array here. So it's obviously going to be a string, but you can also hard code string as well. So that'll work as well. And then in here, we can say C out food end line. This should do the trick. And there you go. So that's two different looping techniques that you should be familiar with when it comes to working with arrays. And just to show you that auto should work as well. When you use auto, food is still going to be typed to a string statically. So we, it's not like it's just some dynamic type, but it just figures that out for us. There you go. These two different array types, they both work. I would probably prefer the second one, which is more modern and has different methods that make things easier for us. But the key thing to know here is that these are both statically sized. You determine the size of these arrays at compile time. If you want an array that can grow and shrink, that concept, a dynamic array, without having to manually worry about memory management, then you can use an existing type known as a vector. So a vector is what we're going to be talking about in the next video. And this is going to make the entire array experience very awesome. You can make a lot of cool applications with vectors. So stay tuned for that and be sure to subscribe. Welcome to episode 20. This video, we're gonna be talking about vectors. You can think of these as dynamic arrays. Instead of defining the size statically at compile time, these can grow and shrink throughout the code execution. This is essential if you don't know what size to make an array ahead of time. To describe vectors, we're actually going to start with an array. So if you've been following along, you might have code like this or you can create this code real quick. The primary difference, well, first off, we're going to include vector, like so. It's going to be very similar to the way you define an array from the standard namespace. You will replace array here with vector, and you can remove the size. Other than that, the code should work exactly the same way. So let's go ahead and run this and see if it works. No errors, and we get grapes, carrots, lemons displayed in the output. Perfect. So that is your essentials of vectors. However, there's a lot of more useful information. The first thing you should know is that we did not define the size. The next thing you should know is that it can grow in size using a method foods dot push back. So push underscore back. You can pass in another value in here, tortillas. And without changing any of our other code, we should now see that displayed in the output. Lovely. Now this is what's a nice feature of using this type of for loop. We don't have to worry about the size, but even if we had a traditional for loop, it would work fairly similar because there is the size method on a vector. So we will define it like so int i is zero, i is less than foods dot size. 
and then i plus plus c out foods of i and we'll throw in an end line there as well so this will work for vectors as well and you can see the output will be here twice since we have both those loops running now another important difference between vectors and arrays is in how the data can be initialized so i want to show you something you can do with vectors which is actually moving that down and replacing the equals here with a semicolon so we define the vector and then down here we will actually assign the value so foods is assigned this collection of foods we should be able to run this and get the same output that we were originally getting this is totally okay with vectors because they're dynamically sized we can define them without any size up here and then we can assign the initialization later this cannot be done with standard arrays, so if instead of vector of string we had string foods, even if we do put the value 3 here, this assignment is invalid. I'm not entirely sure why it's invalid, because I feel that it should work, and even leaving this empty is not going to work either. So with arrays, you can only assign a collection of elements on that first initialization with the declaration. So it would have to look like this, where we take this back to how we had it, like so. And we're not going to be able to use pushback with an array. This syntax is perfectly fine for vectors as well. However, we can also use the collection of elements to assign a value to the vector later on. If you need to define the vector, but you don't have the values yet, you can define it separately. So to bring that back to how we had it, we would say vector of whatever type, let's say string, and then we will remove the square brackets, we create the definition, and then later we can assign a collection of elements. So this will initialize foods with three elements, and later we can add more elements. That is your introduction to vectors, nothing too crazy. They work fairly similar to arrays, just with a little bit more uh, dynamicness. Next video, which is going to be very important, we're going to talk about passing arrays and vectors to functions. If you don't understand this section, there's a very good chance you're going to mess something up. So really highly recommend you watch the next video and not just this video. Thank you so much for watching. Stay tuned. I'll see you in the next one. Peace out. Hey there, and welcome to this video. We are going to be talking about passing arrays of both types, so the old school and the array from the standard library, and passing vectors to functions. There's some differences between all of these three that you should be aware of. If you're not, there's a good chance you're going to mess something up or get results that you're not expecting. So definitely pay attention to this video. So this is the code we have so far. What I'm going to be doing is creating three functions. A function to print old school C style arrays, a function to print the arrays from the standard namespace, and a function to print vectors. Basically taking this printing functionality and extracting it into a function. So let's start with the basic array. We will say void print array. Now the approach to printing an array is actually taking two arguments. So we will go ahead and define the array itself, which we'll call items. We're gonna keep it general. We're using foods down below, but since this is just going to print an array, it doesn't actually need to know about food necessarily. And we're also going to have the size, and we'll talk about that. To print this, we will use a normal for loop. So let's go ahead and define that structure. And we'll say int i is zero i is less than size and then i plus plus the size is the parameter defined above and inside of the for loop we will print so see out items of i and then end line pretty simple nothing too crazy let's create an array to actually use this so right now we have a vector let's go ahead and just push all of this code down we will end up probably using that vector later. And I'm going to remove these two for loops since we're going to be printing them from the function anyways. So let's go ahead and define a string array foods. And I'm going to number these because I'm going to go through the example with three different types. So we'll keep all of them so you can see all of them at once. So foods one is going to be the old school array and we will create this of size three. Now let's go size five just to 
I don't know, switch things up, keep it a little crazy, and we will initialize this with some values. So let's just define some foods here. Definitely drop a comment saying what your favorite food is. I would have to say mine is apple crisp, which is not really food. It's kind of like a dessert, but I guess it's food, right? It's calories, a lot of calories. All right, so we have our array. We will print this with print array, passing in foods one and the size, which is five. None of this code down here is doing anything, but just to avoid any confusion on output, we're just going to comment all of that out and just focus on the array for right now. Let's run this and confirm that we get all these outputted in the terminal. You can see we do get five elements displayed. Now I wanna show you a little trick to getting this size. Unfortunately, we can't say foods one dot size like we did for the vector, but we can say size of foods one, which actually will get the size in memory. And since the memory size isn't the same exact thing as the number of elements, we can actually divide by the size of whatever the element is. These are all going to be the same type of elements. So we can say size of and pass in foods one index zero. That's a little trick you can use to calculate the size of an old school array. Running this now, we should get the same result, making sure we get five things showing up. One, two, three, four, five. Perfect. You might initially be confused because the size of these strings differ. So how does this technique work? Well, the reality is that these strings are stored as pointers to the different strings in the array. And that's how the static size works. Each one of these strings is given the same amount of size because the pointers are consistent in size and then they point to some other area in memory, which is variable length. Yeah, as you can see, these are not all the same, but I'm kind of getting off topic. So let's get back to what we were talking about. So that is how you will do this with a, a normal array. Now you might be thinking to do this technique inside of the function instead of having the size. And this is where a lot of people can make mistakes because when you pass an array, to a function, it decays to a pointer. The phrase decaying basically just meaning there's a loss of information. The amount of information we can retrieve from this array has been lessened. And now we're just working with the bare minimum, which is a pointer to this area in memory. We no longer have the ability to calculate the size of the entire array. It's just a pointer to the first element. The next function I wanna make is to print a standard namespace array so print std array and this one's parameter will be defined as an array of type string in this case and we will call it items we will need to define the size here as well so it's a little bit more challenging to make this work with variable sizes as this one is it is probably possible but to make it easy, we're just going to hard code that value there. And the reason that is, is because the five in the string here is part of the type. So a string comma five is a distinct type from string comma six. So when we have to define the type of the parameter, that is why it's requiring the size to be defined here. It's kind of a bummer, but that's just what we're going to be doing. And this is why I generally just use vectors for everything, unless there's a specific reason I need to use or want to use an array. So this one for the loop is actually going to look very similar. We'll say int i is zero, i is less than, and we don't say size this time, we'll just use items.size. You, you could just type five, or you could say items.size, either one will work. And then i++. And then same output here, c out items of i and then end line cool so let's go ahead and create a standard namespace array and let's go ahead and define that here so array type string five elements and we'll call this foods two and i'm going to use this same exact collection here so this initialized to the same exact values so we'll copy that and paste that there. And now we will pass this to print standard array. So print std array foods two. 
and we don't need to pass in the size, so the invocation is much simpler. Run this. We should get the full output from this first print array for the basic array. So we get tacos all the way through pumpkin, and then it repeats tacos all the way through pumpkin. So that is how you print an array from the standard namespace. The last one I got for you is a vector. So let's go ahead and say void print vector. This one will take a vector of type string. The nice thing here is we don't have to worry about size. So vector string items. And the code here is going to be exactly the same as this one here. So I'll copy that and paste that here. Let's go ahead and define a vector. We will do that here. Vector of type string. And again, the initialization is going to be exactly the same. So I'm gonna copy this here and bring that down here. And we will call this foods three. Cool, now let's go ahead and say print vector foods three. And that should do the trick. Running this and you can see we get tacos through pumpkin, perfect. And that, I forgot we had a vector defined here already, but that's okay. We can do something similar, so if we wanted to add something to it, we can. I'll take that and paste it here. And this will be foods. Three dot pushback tortillas. Now it should print the entire collection, not just up to pumpkin. And you can see we get tortillas down there at the bottom of the terminal. There's one more thing I want to explain to you. And for this, I'm going to type out something, follow along, and I will explain in a second. So we are going to output foods one without any index. And then we'll say end line. When we run this, we'll get some strange looking value. And you may or may not be familiar with this structure, but this is hexadecimal, zero through nine and A through F. It's an easy way to represent different things in computers, in this case, a memory location. You may also see an ampersand. I'll show you that as well. So we will say C out ampersand foods one and line. This is the address of operator. So when we run this, you can see we get the same value. Now on the inside of the function, what I want to do is output items. So we will say C out items. And when we do this, we'll get the same value as outside of the function. So we have three of the same values here. What this means is that the items array here that we're talking about inside of this function is the same exact array. Meaning if we modify it inside of this function, those changes will then be seen outside of that function. This is different than how vectors work and I'm going to actually show that to you in a second. Let's do the same exercise but with this next array foods 2. I'm going to get rid of this line here since it gives us the same value. We don't have to worry about that. We will say C out foods 2 and L. This will actually not let us do that and we're actually going to need to use the address of operator. So it'll look like this. And then inside of the function We'll say C out items and line. And similarly, we're going to use the address of operator. And this might actually make more sense if we move this call to after printing that first array. So let's go ahead and move that down here. So that way it'll show up right before printing that array. So we'll run this and you can see these are the same two values these are two different values. What this helps me show is that the array on the inside of the function is actually a different array. The values are copied over to the new location, meaning modifications inside of this function do nothing to the array defined on the outside of the function. And then let's do one last one just to keep building on this idea. It's going to be very similar for the vector. So address, of foods three and one. And then on the inside, here let's space this out just a bit so you can see. Great. On the inside in print vector, we will say C out address of items. 
Okay. We'll run this. And just like the standard array, we should see two different values here. So it's only for the old school array that the values are the same. So these are copied by value two. If it's a really, really big vector, then there's tricks you can use to, you know, pass by reference or pointers or whatever. We talk about that in some other videos and you'll see some examples of that coming up soon. But for now, it's just good to understand the default behavior. So to prove this a little bit more, what I want to do is inside of this loop, instead of outputting that value alone, we're going to change the value. So we'll say items of i is pi, whatever it might be, it doesn't really matter. And I'm going to take this and do the same thing for these other functions as well. So I'll paste that there and we will paste that here. And running this, you should see pi displayed on all of these. That should be expected. But then what I want to do is I want to actually print the array on the outside. I know this is a lot of setup, but it takes some effort to attempt to prove what I'm saying. So auto f comes from foods one, c out, f, and line. We're going to do the same thing for each one of these. So after foods2, we will print it, and this we will just rename it to foods2. And then after foods3, we will print it as well, renaming this to foods3. So the output of this is going to be pretty sloppy, but I'm going to explain everything and hopefully you understand. All right, so let's just start from the beginning here. It appears it's cutting off some of the older output for some reason, so we're just going to comment out the output here. It's not really that important. So inside of these functions, we'll comment that. We'll run this, and this is what it looks like. So let's run through this. The first time around, we're using the old school array. All of the items are changed to pi. And then later on, when we print it on the outside of the function call, you can see they all remained pi. For the standard array, we changed them all to pi inside of the function here. But on the outside, when we printed it here, we get the original old values. And it works the same way for the vector, even though we are changing each element to pi. That's because this items and this items are referring to different areas of memory than the foods2 and foods3 down here. Whereas foods1 displayed here is the same area of memory as this items here. So the changes on the inside of this function affect the outside data. All right, that video was obnoxious. I hope I didn't distract too much away from the point by actually showing each one of these things in action. I just wanted to actually confirm my understanding and show that to you so you can see how this works. Later on, you will learn more about passing by reference and other variations which will allow you to change the behavior but that is all i got for this video stay tuned for the next one and be sure to subscribe what's going on everybody in this video we are going to be talking about function overloading this is when you can have multiple functions with the same name the way you choose which one to invoke is by what data you pass it so for those of you who have been following along you might be familiar with these functions, but these are three different functions. The first will print a regular array, the second will print an array from the standard namespace, and then the third will print a vector. These are all very similar, and they do pretty much the same thing. They print something. So we could actually name these all the same thing, such as print, but I'm actually going to be a little bit more specific here. I'll say print collection, um, implying collection being like an array, a vector, a deck, whatever it may be. So in this case, it's going to be these three collections, an array, a standard namespace array, and a vector. So this is actually going to work. We're not going to get any compiling errors initially, except from the calling code down here, which we need to update. So we can change this from print array to print collection, and the same for these as well. Perfect. 
So let's run this. And you can see all of the printing works as expected. Well, which one to call it depends on the data we pass in. It's smart enough to know that this should be the first function, this should be the second function, and this should be that third function. This should basically be used when you have some repeating functionality that you might expect different inputs for. Now, in order for an overload to be valid, it has to have different parameters. So what might be confusing at first is if I copy this and let's paste this and inside of here we will return true and change this from a void function to a bool function this is actually not a valid overload and that's exactly what you'll see in this little error pop up so that's just an important thing to know. I'm going to remove this as this is just for example's sake. Now you might look at these functions and realize, wow, the code between these is very similar. What if we could, in certain scenarios, just have one code section and invoke that for all of these different overloads? So let's say this was the code that we wanted to run and we just wanted it to work for these two functions as well you can actually do that by invoking print collection inside of this function. So it might look like this, print collection, and which one is it going to run? Well, it's going to run the first one by passing in items, but it has to be of type array. How is that going to work if it's currently a standard namespace array? Well, there is a method on this called data, and this will actually return the array data. So that is how we can convert to an old school array. And then we can also pass in items.size. And this will basically act as a replacement to all of this code down here. So we can remove this. And vectors actually have a very similar capability. Actually, it's exactly the same. So we will say print collection, passing in items.data and items size. So basically we're saying, hey, for both of these functions, we just want to pass in the data as an array and the size to this other function up here and have it print the data. That'll save us from having repeating code and possibly introducing bugs in our software. And you can see it appears to work the same way. Awesome. In the next video, we're going to talk about function templates, as it is possible to design a function to accept multiple types as the arguments, and that is where function templates come in. So definitely check out the next video where we'll get some hands-on experience with that. See ya, peace out. Hey everybody, welcome. This should be a pretty quick video about function templates. This is how we can basically make a general function to work with various types. Many of you will probably be familiar with the template concept from other programming languages known as generics. So we are doing generic programming here where we're not associating our code to specific types. So in our code currently we have some overloading for this print collection function and this is the main functionality here. But this is currently typed to a string array where we pass in the size. What I want to do for demonstration purposes is scoot this code down because I want to keep those functions and we're just going to create some variations. Let's say void print and I'll leave off the collection just so we can have those variations as well. And we are going to define it pretty similar in structure like that. But the main difference is above the function we are going to have the keyword template and then in angle brackets less than or greater than we will say type name t. Basically what this is saying is, hey, we have some type we will call T. And the reason we call it T is because it kind of makes sense for the word type. We can call it whatever we want, but we have some random letter or word here because we cannot say something specific. We have to keep this very general. If this is your first time doing anything like this, it can be a little confusing. So don't mind it if you have to watch this video a couple of times. Now, when we define the parameters, we will, instead of using a specific type, use T. So this is of some type, we don't know what type it is, and we will call that variable collection. And we're going to have an int size because I'm expecting this to be used for an array, but you can also do overloading with templates. So you could basically make a print function that could work with everything if you wanted but we're just going to start with the basics here. Now, everything else is pretty much going to be the same. So 
we will go ahead and write that code out for int i zero i is less than size i plus plus c out and we can use that collection variable just like usual and this indexing syntax works for arrays vectors and the stl or standard library arrays so we will go ahead and use that and expect it to work now the interesting thing here is you might be wondering if we're making this general function and we invoke it but pass it something that doesn't work in this way how's it going to know that are we going to run it and it just crashes well this is all going to be caught at compile time you see what we're doing now is we're not actually creating a function we're creating a template for a function at compile time it's going to analyze all of our calls to this general function and generate the appropriate function signatures to match those different types if there's an invalid mismatch for types or we're trying to do something that doesn't work with the data we're passing it, it's going to know at compile time. So we don't have to worry about potential runtime errors, and we don't have to worry about creating a function that is going to work in every possible scenario, because we don't have to worry about running that code with incompatibilities. We will always figure that out at compile time, and I'll show you an example of that. First, let's talk about how we use this function. I need to work on my posture, man. I'm like, ooh. All right, from now on, I am sitting up straight. So we have the function, let's try to invoke this function. We will go down to our calling code. We have these other print collections for the other functions. I'm just going to comment these out briefly. And we will try to invoke a new one. So print, and what are we gonna pass in? Foods one and the size five. Hit run. And that works. Now, you can invoke this function using other types because we can often easily convert to an array. So for example, you could say foods.data and passing in nothing for that, but also the size, so foods2.size. This should work as well. And actually, if you watched the previous video, real quick, I'm trying not to get too distracted, but you could of course when you had these overloads for print collection, these two were kind of a convenience because you could convert the standard namespace array to an old school array when you invoke the function using foods.data. Same thing for the vector. So these functions are not really needed, they are just an added convenience. But anyways, back to what we were saying, we can invoke print passing in this type which is also an array and we get the int so this is going to work this doesn't actually show us anything useful though because what I want to be able to do is pass in foods to and you can see in this scenario it works there we go we're passing in a type that is not an array and this function still works if we tried to do the same with this print collection, it's not going to work because this is expecting only a string array. So to prove that to you, if we invoke this by saying print collection, that one works, and print collection, this one does not work. You're gonna have a type problem. No matching function for call to print collection. So that's where the template functions come in handy. They allow us to pass in more than just one type. Now, let's do the same thing with the vector just to finish this off. So we'll say foods3 and foods3.size. But what if we wanted to be able to say foods2 like so? Since this is a standard library array, it should have the size attached to the object. Why would we need to pass it in as a separate argument here? It's not very user friendly. Same thing for a vector. If we went ahead and said print foods3, this should work. By should work, I mean it would make sense for this to work. So let's go ahead and implement this by creating a template function overload. Scrolling up to the top where we defined print, we can create another function here, void print, and in this one, we can have it so it does not require the size. And we can say t collection, and we will basically use the same exact code you can copy and paste it, or you could just invoke the other version. So that's what we'll do. We'll say print passing in collection, 
and collection dot size. We're getting one error and that is because I forgot this template type name T at the top. So make sure you put that. Perfect. Now we shouldn't get an error there and our calling code should remove that error. Cool, so now we have an overload that'll take just a single argument, which is the collection, and you can see that works. Now we're getting a bunch of prints because we have five of them here. So at this point, since we have these two versions, you're not going to need to use these two at all. What if you try to use an incompatible type? For example, in this function, we are using collection.size. Well, dot size doesn't exist on all types. For example, it doesn't exist on classic old school arrays. You would have to have that size passed in as a separate argument. What that means is if we tried to invoke print, but passed in foods one, and we did not use a size, you can see we get an error at compiling. Taking a look, and the error is kind of complex, but it's complaining about a pointer. As you remember from what I've said in previous videos, the basic arrays decay to pointers. So it's not even going to let us run this code. Another example would be if we passed in not a collection, but let's say a string, hello, and we run now, similarly going to get an error. And let's try one more type just to confirm this idea. Let's go ahead and pass in a double. So we'll say 50.5, hit run. And again, it's just complaining about that type. So we don't have to worry about any weird runtime errors or exceptions being thrown because it's not able to generate a correct function using this template based on the data we passed in. And that's because the dot size doesn't exist on a double variable. So hopefully this has been a good introduction to templatized functions. This is extremely handy. You're probably gonna run into this a lot and you'll probably see more complex versions as well. So make sure you understand this at least a bit and I'll see you in the next video where we're going to be talking about a new data structure called a deck. This is pretty interesting if you're trying to create a stack or a queue, which we're going to talk about those data structures as well. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Peace out. What's going on everybody? This episode, we're gonna be talking about decks. This is short for double-ended queue. This is a data structure where you can append to either side of the collection. So it's very similar to a vector, but with some minor differences that can help you choose which one to use. Fortunately, they're very similar in their usage, so it's not a major learning curve. So the way I understand it is that you can use a deck in a very similar way as a vector. The difference is how the deck is implemented behind the scenes. It is optimized for insertion and retrieval from either end of the collection. So if you're going to be doing something where it's continually adding or removing data from the top or bottom of the collection, then I would recommend going with a deck. If you're familiar at all with time complexity, it's O of one to insert at the beginning or at the end of this collection, as well as retrieving that data. If you can imagine keeping track of the beginning and the end of this collection, you can easily access that data immediately. But because this is a linked list and the data is chained together from beginning to end, accessing anything in the middle is O of N, meaning it can take multiple iterations to get the correct data and that time will increase with the growth of the size of the collection. I know I haven't talked a ton about data structures, so don't worry if that doesn't make complete sense right now. The main thing to know is that this is very efficient when working at the ends. And this is going to be a collection, so all of these templatized functions should work as well. Let's go ahead and create a deck of type string, and we will call this foods4. And similarly, we can initialize this in the same way that we've done with these others. So let me just go ahead and copy this assignment. We will copy that and bring that down here to assign to our deck. Pasting that there and I accidentally put the equal sign twice. All right, there we go. The difference here is not only do we have the ability to say foods for dot push back, which is a feature of a vector, we also have the ability to push front. So we can pass in here, lettuce, and while we're at it, let's do a push back as well. So foods for dot push back, and we'll throw in here cheese. 
Alright, so now we should be able to just print this collection by saying print, passing in foods for. Check out the previous video if you want to understand how that print works, but a quick preview is you can see that right here. I'm going to comment out these other prints so it doesn't pollute. Actually, I don't need none of this junk. Let's just go ahead and delete it. Clean up a little bit. All right, so now we just have a few different collections and we're printing our deck. So let's go ahead and run this. I'm not sure how, but my uh, last word got removed somehow. So pumpkin, I must uh, mistype somehow. Let's try this again here. So there's our collection, and you can see lettuce is at the top from push front, and then cheese is at the bottom from push back. Seeing this allows us to understand a bit more how this might work, because imagine you had a shopping list, and I asked you to add something to the end, or add something to the beginning. You could do that very easily, because you just jump to the bottom or jump to the top and add that thing in. Similarly, retrieving that data is going to be very quick. Hey, what was the first thing we needed on our list? boom, you just jump to the very front. But if I asked you, hey, is uh, pizza on our shopping list? You'd have to go through all those elements until you either hit pizza or went through everything and realized it wasn't there. So we are going to use the deck throughout the rest of the videos. We're going to take a break from it though, because in the next video, we're gonna talk about reading from files, which is gonna be pretty exciting. Pretty soon, we're also gonna be talking about object-oriented programming and custom objects, which is gonna be sweet. So stay tuned. I'll see you in the upcoming episodes. Peace out. What's going on everybody? This is episode 25 and we are going to be talking about reading and writing to files. I actually really like this in C++. It's quite easy. If you already know how to work with writing and reading from the console, moving to a file is very similar. So here is our code. I deleted a lot of stuff from the previous video. So now we just have a main function that is empty and we have two print functions to print collections that we might end up using later. I removed everything else. So for this, what we're going to do is we're going to include f stream and f I believe is short for file. And you probably want to include it, not include it. So we will fix that real quick. And let's go ahead and ask the user a question and then read their information from the console. We will take what they wrote to the console and write it to a file. So C out. What did you eat today? Or no, let's just go, what did you eat? Let's say this is some kind of tracker. We want to keep track of calories or just diet. And the item is going to be inputted from console in, like so. The way you write to a file is you're going to say OF stream file passing in a value, specifically a string for the name of the file. So we could say foods.txt or whatever you want this to be. And then afterwards, you're going to say file.close. Now this doesn't actually write the item to the file. I don't really like that word. Let's go ahead and change it to food. So we have a string food. And what we will do is we will say file, which is our object here we created, and output the food item to that file. So it's pretty much just like outputting to the console, but instead of using C out, you're going to use that file object. So let's run this. What did you eat? Lemons. And press any key to continue. Okay, so what happened exactly? Where did this file go? If we open up our projects, I accidentally closed it, so I'm just going to bring that back here and drag this over to the right. You can see right here inside of the target platforms, which generally I like to switch this to 64 bit. And I'll go ahead and run this again, lemons. Now when we go into our project, we can right click, show in Explorer. That's going to bring up the folder structure. And inside of Windows 64, debug, we now have this foods text document. Opening that up, you can see the value lemons. So that is where the actual file is. So if you want it to show up over here, you can do that. You can say right click, add and then you can actually go into that folder and grab any file grabbing the text document hit open you can see windows 64 debug foods.txt so that's how we can regularly reference that file now if we wanted to read this value from the file let's go ahead and figure out how to do that 
instead of creating an OF stream, we're going to change this to IF stream. So instead of output, it's going to be input. We will no longer need to get the value from the user. Instead, down here, we will say string food and then flip these arrows around into food. So coming from the file into food, similar to how we read from CN, and then we could actually see out you ate food. Hit run, and you can see you ate lemons. Awesome. So you can see that reading and writing to the file is working. Now let's talk about writing and reading multiple items. We will remove this code since we're going to go back to what we had, but it's going to be a little bit different. So we'll have an OF stream foods.txt. Instead of asking the user for multiple foods, let's just go ahead and define a deck real quick of type string foods, and this will be initialized with a few values. So lemons, cheesecake, and salmon. We can loop through these. So after we've opened the file, we'll say four, and inside of here, every single item in here, so type string food, which comes from foods. We will output this just like to see out, but instead it's going to be to the file. So file, food, and line, and then file.close. So let's run this real quick. Nothing shows up, which is expected. Uh, it's freaking out because the text file has been changed, yes to all. And uh, foods.txt now has those three values. So far, so good. Now let's talk about how we can read those values. So we will remove this code here. And for the deck, what I'll do is just have it start being empty and we'll actually add data to it. So we can remove all of this, replace it with a semicolon, create an input file stream. And here's a little trick. You can read from the file into a food variable, which we will define. And you can do this inside of the loop. It'll evaluate to true as long as there some as long as there's some information to be retrieved. So it'll continue to do this until the file has been read all the way through. Inside of here, we can just say foods dot push back, passing in the food. Finally, since we created that nice handy dandy print function, we can just say print foods and confirm that we get all of these values in the terminal. Running this, and you can see it was able to successfully read each of those foods. So those are the different variations of reading and writing to files that I wanted to talk about. That's all I got in this video. Hopefully it was helpful. Stay tuned. I'll see you in the next video. What's going on everybody? This episode is one I have been looking forward to for much of the series and that is object-oriented programming. Some of you are probably really excited and part of you are probably dying inside, but I'm going to try to make it as simple as humanly possible. I'll keep these videos nice and easy and short to the point. I won't even ramble for like 30 seconds in the intro, okay? I'll just get right to it. So object-oriented programming is one of those things that it takes some time to kind of grasp the concept and the syntax for everything. So don't fret if you don't have it immediately. We're going to go through a fairly simple example and you should try to understand this material before moving on to the next video. So you start by creating what's known as a class. This is a blueprint, a structure that basically describes what something would look like. The class is then instantiated, fancy word. And this means we create something, also known as an object, based on that structure. So we have a class and then we can create multiple objects from that class. So here we are in our code. We still have some functions from earlier, but we're not going to need those right now. So don't worry about it if you're just jumping in for the object-oriented programming content. What we will do is we will define a class and describe some concept such as food. And then you will have curly braces. And note there's no parentheses like you normally define functions or if statements or anything like that. And inside of here, you're going to have the keyword public. And then inside of this, after a colon, is where we're going to define what a food looks like. So it can have different data attributes, such as a name, what the name of the food is, like banana or whatever other foods there are. Literally can't think of anything. And 
you can have any data you want. So let's say you were keeping track of the cost of all these foods you're buying from the store. You could have a double cost, double being just a number with a fractional part. So $10.15. Now this is the class. We're not actually making a specific food. To create a specific food, that's known as an object. And we can do that inside of our main code. So we will do that here. You will say what type the variable is and then give it a name. Now I'm gonna name these both food, one lowercase and one uppercase. And people sometimes get annoyed that I do this, but I do this on purpose because it's convention. The lowercase refers to the variable. The uppercase refers to the type. There's no need for you to have different names for these. You should be able to look at these and just know what they are. So what I mean by type is we're actually creating a custom type here. Just like we could create a string or a double, now we can create a food. Pretty cool. And the food can have different attributes. So food dot is how you access those different attributes. And you can say name, give it a name such as bananas. And food dot cost, give that a value such as $20.41. Pretty expensive bananas, but inflation, right? All right, so now how do we actually access these values? We'll say see out food dot name. And let's go ahead and add a space and then food.cost, end L. We'll run this, and you see it says the food name and then the cost. So it's basically a way to organize data, and it makes sense when we have a bunch of data around a certain thing, such as a food. So we can have data members like these here, which store some data, but we can also have methods which will do something. So we could say void print, and this can be used to print all of the data. So let's just go ahead and copy this example here, but we're going to have to modify it a little bit. So I'll cut that from there and paste it here. Clean up the formatting just a bit. You can see this food here now doesn't exist. We can actually just remove that and it knows what we're talking about. It's going to refer to whatever object we're currently invoking print on. So to use this, we will just say, food.print. Let's run this and confirm that we get the output we would expect. And there we go, we get the same exact thing. But since this print is related to the food, it just makes sense to put that inside of the class here. The cool thing is now we can create multiple foods. So if we wanted to create another food, we could say food2, and then we could say food2, make sure you have the two so you're not changing the other food name and we'll go with something like cheese and the food two dot price uh, I don't know 274 dollars my bad I got the attribute name wrong so we want to make sure we go with the correct one there and then we will say food two dot print so food two dot print run this and see the correct output awesome so it doesn't seem super valuable when we just have a really small class, but as this class grows and grows, it's a great way to keep things organized. This is the introduction to object-oriented programming, which is basically a whole paradigm of how we program. And doing this ourselves, creating our own classes, is going to help you understand a lot of the code that's out there. That's all I got in this episode. Stay tuned. We're going to be using this object-oriented programming for the rest of this series. Hello everybody, this video we are going to continue our discussion on object-oriented programming by reading values from a file, a text file, and creating custom objects from that data. So this is building on a lot of principles we've talked about in previous videos, so reading and writing to files, but now we're going to introduce objects to the mix. So in our code example here, we have two food objects, one bananas and one cheese. Similar to how if we wanted to store a bunch of strings, it can get a little obnoxious having multiple variables. So you can actually create a vector or a deck or, or an array, really any collection, you can use a custom type, in this case food. So what we could do is, if I can just move this code down for a second so we can reference it or see it, we can say deck of type food, call it foods, and end it in a semicolon. For this, you'll want to make sure that you have imported deck. You could also use a vector if you're more familiar. And now what we can do is talk about how we could use foods inside of this deck. You can say foods dot push back or push front, passing in 
that food object. Then instead of food.print, what you could do is say foods index zero dot print. So this is how you could access that food object. And that's how we can keep all of our foods organized. So we could do the same thing with this food object down here. So we'll create a second index in our deck by saying foods dot push back, passing in food two. And then instead of food two dot print, you could say foods index zero dot print. Now this doesn't really change the functionality of our code. We basically just added a new collection to make things more complicated. But in some scenarios, you're not going to have that object defined like we did here, such as when you're reading it from a file. You know, if you're going to have hundreds of food items, you're not going to have a variable for each individual one, so you'll need to reference it through the collection. But just to make sure I'm not insane, although I don't think this proves anything, let's just make sure our code shows up. This with the, Oh, that's bad. We got the same value in here. So what did I do wrong? I meant to say foods one. See, I knew I was insane. There we go, that's a little bit better. Now, if we wanted to go through all of the foods and print them, you might think to use one of our print functions we defined earlier passing in foods. However, unfortunately, this isn't going to work the way we would expect. For one, we get about 6 billion errors because as of right now, we don't have a way to just output our object through C out. So let me show you what I mean exactly. If we go down here and instead of passing it to print, we say C out foods and we'll say index zero. This is going to give us an error. Now you can overload this operator this is known as the insertion operator. So it is possible to make the syntax work. And in that situation, you wouldn't need to do much changing with the way we print our data. You can read about that online. We're not going to get to this quite yet, maybe in a later video. So instead, what we'll do is we'll just create a custom print function that takes the custom type. So we'll say print, this will be void. And we'll just keep this specific to our example. Um, as we continue, we could make this more generic or use templates, but I think long term the solution would be to do the overriding. But for simplicity here, what I want to do is just say for, and I'll go ahead and use the range based for loop. So food f coming from what will be passed in, which will be a deck of type food, foods is the variable name and notice we're getting an error because of where we define this function so i'll fix that in a second but this is going to come from foods and let me go ahead and take this whole function cut that and move it below the class definition right here and now in here we can just say food.print which is that custom method we created and if you wanted to we can call it food instead of f it might be a little clear so yeah again just with the conventions capital f is the type lowercase is the variable and lowercase but plural is the collection so familiarize yourself with that now what we should be able to do is inside of main invoke print foods passing in foods Let's try it out. So we're doing two prints already, so we might get some double prints here. But yeah, it seems to be working. Awesome. Now let's talk about reading and writing to files. So instead of hard coding these values here, actually we could start with these and we will write them to a file and then we can learn how to read them from that file. So we will clean up some of this. Let's get rid of these prints and this print down here. So we can print all of them once if you wish. What we will do is we will define an output file stream file passing in some value such as foods.txt, which we currently already have in existence, but it would generate it. If not, make sure you include fstream and we will iterate through each one of these foods. So for and food, food coming from foods we will output to the file what are we going to output we'll say food dot name and then let's just do a space and then we'll do food dot cost 
and then an end line. And then lastly, we will say file.close. All right, let's go ahead and run this. Check out foods.txt afterwards. Yeah, we can reload that and check it out. We got the food, the price, and it's one on each line. Perfect. So we could basically imagine saving our list to some file, and then we might want to read that later. So how do we actually read a file? Well, we could create, uh, instead of an OF stream, an IF stream, just to focus on one of these at a time. Let's go ahead and comment this out. But it's going to be pretty similar, so you could probably just edit it or do it down here. File, passing in foods.txt. And we'll use that looping technique I taught you in the video a few ago on reading and writing from files. So we can read from the file by saying file, outputting the value into a food object. So let's just create a, a temporary food object. So food temp, and then we'll say temp.name. And you can actually grab the next thing after the space with another operator here. This is the extraction operator, and we will put that in temp.cost, and then we can just add that to some collection. So we can define another collection here. We'll just say deck of type food, saved foods, and we'll just leave it like that. And then we'll just say saved foods dot push back, passing in the temp object of type food. And then lastly, afterwards, what I want to do is just print all of the saved foods. So print foods, passing in saved foods. Let's just make sure before we run this that we're not printing anything else. If you just want to be 100% sure, let's just comment out all of this stuff. So we can just remove that comment now. So now this is the opening comment of our multi-line comment, and then it'll go all the way down here. I'm just leaving that there for reference if you guys want to refer back to that. So now let's run this. First, taking a look at foods.txt, we have three, two things in here. Let's go ahead and make a third thing just to test it out. So what do you guys want to add in here? Burgers? Oh, sure. Let's go with that. $62.32. We will save this file, and then I will go and run. And there you go. You can see we're able to successfully read all that information from the file and store it in a food deck and then print each one of those food items. Hopefully that was a helpful introduction to reading and writing custom objects to files. Next up, we're going to talk about constructors and the static keyword. Two very important things when it comes to object-oriented programming, so definitely check it out. And be sure to slap the subscribe button. Thank you, I'll see you in the next one. What's going on everybody? This episode, we're gonna talk about constructors. This is a pretty important concept to understand. This is what is invoked when you create an object. The instantiation process is done through a constructor. It's kind of just like a function, but with the sole purpose of creating that object. So let's go ahead and just code out some examples so you can see what this looks like. So here we have code that is going to create a deck or some collection you could use a vector if you prefer and it'll create a temporary food object and then it's going to read from foods.txt reading the name of the food and the cost of the food and create an object and put it inside of the saved foods collection lastly we will print all of the foods so where does the constructor come in well when we say food temp whatever you may call that, this is invoking a constructor. It's like a function designed for creating objects. So this is created for us automatically. However, we can make a custom one if we wish. So the syntax for this is going to be no return, so just the function name, and the function name is going to match the class exactly. So it'll look like this. And we'll say constructor hit. And this will just prove that I'm not missing something and that this actually is being executed. So it reads all of these and you can see constructor hit at the top. So when the object is created that first time, that's when the constructor is hit. All of the other times, it is just reassigning values to name and cost. It's not creating a new object. 
By the way, this is our foods.txt file if you need that. So the awesome part about constructors is it can allow us to pass in specific data to the constructor. So we could have the user pass in a string of name and a double of cost. And inside of here, we can assign it to that object. So that way, our object is initialized immediately with some values. To do this, we will say name and assign it some value, specifically the name parameter. Now this is a potential problem because the first one here, I want to refer to this here. The second one here, I wanted to refer to this here. To be more specific and say, hey, we want this to refer to that attribute on the object, we will use the this keyword followed by an arrow. So a minus sign and then a greater than sign. We'll do something very similar for the cost. So we'll say this cost is cost. However, we're not quite able to run this code yet. You see, we will get some errors. The main problem is now when we define a custom constructor, the default constructor no longer exists. This is kind of strange. Why does it create it for us automatically unless we create some variation, then the default one doesn't exist? Well, if you can imagine a scenario where I only want an object to be created through this certain custom function, and we don't want that default one to actually exist at all, all you have to do is create a custom one. Then we never have to worry about that object being in an only partially initialized state. It's always going to go through the same process to be fully initialized. Initialized, I'm using that word kind of vaguely. It could mean anything you want, but the main thing is in this scenario, assigning it some values to the data members. If you want to have that default constructor, even though we have a custom one, you can make two constructors, just another overload, it's going to look very similar where we just have food and in this case it can be an empty body. This will allow our code to run as it did before without any changes. So far so good. So how do you actually use this other constructor we created? Well, when we invoke food temp, you can use parentheses here passing in two values. Let's just say test and 25. That is how you would invoke that custom constructor. Doesn't really make a lot of sense here because it's just going to be overwritten down here. So instead of defining the food object here, we will do it inside of the loop. So inside of pushback, we can say food and use parentheses right here after the type passing in the values. So let's say instead of temp.name and temp.cost, we just had those variables and double cost and we just write into those directly. Now we can pass these variables to that custom constructor. So name comma cost. This should in theory work the same way. It's just a different structure and it allows you to understand custom constructors. Perfect. So the default constructor can be used to initialize things to some default value. So if you wanted every single thing to have, you know, cost being set to zero, that is where you would do this. There's an alternative way of doing it though as well, which is up here, you can initialize these to some defaults. So you could set the cost to zero as default. So you can set any default custom values there and you could do the same thing for the name as well. That's your introduction to constructors. The next video, we're going to talk about the static keyword, which is really important. So stay tuned, I'll see you in the next video. What's going on everybody? In this video, we're gonna talk about creating a static method. This is useful when you have a function that you want to associate with a class, but it doesn't really make sense to have that for every single instance of the class. So let's see what we have already and then see where static fits in. So this is a non-static method. It's a function attached to our objects that will be unique for each individual food because the name can change and the cost can change. It's basically when you want something to happen for an individual food, that's where you're going to use a method like so. However, there are scenarios where you might have, <laughs> I just realized I was cutting off. Oh man, <laughs> oh, gosh. I totally lost my train of thought. But basically we have some functionality that's related to foods down here, this print foods, but it doesn't really make sense for an individual food. You can see it relates to a collection of foods, not 
a single food. So this is a good example of something that might be useful as a static method. So let's go ahead and take this and cut that and actually move that to inside of the class. Sorry, my scrolling is so aggressive. And I'm going to do this before the constructors. So I'm gonna do this right here. And I'm just going to format that, make sure it looks correct. And I'm going to prefix this with static. Everything else is going to look pretty much the same. So I can bring this back and reduce the spacing here. How do you actually invoke this function? We've used this down below, we have print foods. Now all you have to do is prefix it with the class, not an object, but food capitalized. I for years have fought the habit of using a dot because that's what I'm so used to from other programming languages. So you're going to prefix it with food colon colon and then print foods. And I'm going to save this to make sure that our functionality stays exactly the same. So we just introduced some refactoring to our code and it looks great. So that is just an improvement in organization. Now what if I wanted to say something like food read data? Instead of having all of this reading functionality inside of main, we could create it as a static method inside of food. So it might look like this. We have our collection defined here and we can just read the data by saying food read foods. Now, obviously this doesn't exist yet, but we're going to create it. Now I noticed I had some leftover code here. I was testing some, so I don't think that's important. I was just creating an object. I was just for the uh, testing the constructors. So all of this code, we can basically extract into a static method, except the print food. We're gonna leave that here. So it'll read from the file and then it'll print the food inside of main. So let's go up into our class and I'm going to define this right here before the constructors. I don't think it really matters, but just trying to be somewhat organized. And this is actually going to return a deck of type food, which is how we can assign it to a variable. And we'll just call this read foods. And inside of the body, we will paste all of that code and just make sure it's nice and formatted like so. Now the saved foods that we were originally working with, since we didn't copy that over, we could just create a deck that we can use temporarily that will eventually be returned. So deck of type food, saved foods. There we go. So this is going to go through the process of reading all of the data and we will want to close the file down here as well. So file.close and we can remove that from our main code down here if we have it. So just make sure you're opening and closing the file. That might have just got lost in the shuffling around, but it looks good now, so let's just test it out. So we will run. It appears that we did not get any compilation errors, but something is not right. A very obviously dumb thing I forgot to do is return saved foods. Noob mistake, let's try this again. And there we go, it's working as we expect. And now in theory, you could extract this whole class, move it to another file, and you won't have to worry about all of this stuff. And this would literally be all your code. Super simple. That's all I got in this video. Stay tuned for the next video where we're going to learn about stacks and queues and get some hands-on experience creating a cool little app to keep track of foods and their costs. So stay tuned. I'll see you in the next episode. Thank you so much for watching. Welcome to episode 30 mates. This video we're going to be talking about stacks and queues, which are two abstract data types. When I say abstract, it means that there is not a type that you type. It's kind of confusing, a type that you type. Um, in the code, right? You're not going to say stack or queue. Rather, you're going to use another data type to enforce certain behaviors. So you can use a vector or a deck, a double ended queue, which have the capabilities to do these things. I highly recommend the deck for most scenarios when you're doing stacks and queues. So a stack, literally, you can visualize stacking things on top of each other. If you want to get back to the bottom, you have to remove one at a time or pop off those values. A queue is another word for a line. 
So as you're adding data, the original first one is going to come out first. So it's gonna continually be, to be adding data to the end of the line. It's kind of hard to illustrate this with my hands and drawing circles in the air. Fortunately, I'm not old school like I used to be and I'm not drawing it up on a whiteboard or chalkboard, but we are going to go through some examples and create a little cool application to add foods to a shopping list, either to the end or to the beginning, and you also have the ability to remove foods as well. So hopefully that all made sense. This may have been my worst introduction ever, but I think that'll probably do. So let's just go with it. It's not gonna make really good sense until we see some concrete examples. So we have food. We'll just call this foods, just to keep things simple here. And we will pass in foods to the print. But what I want to do is I want to ask if the user wants to display the foods, add a food, or remove a food. So to do this, I'm going to create a loop. And we're going to get a response from the user. So we'll say int responses starting at zero. And while you can make an indefinite loop, non-infinite loop, where let's say the user can type in one, two, three, four, or five, or whatever it takes for a menu. But if they say minus one, it will quit. So while response is not equal to minus one, we will display a menu. So let's go over here and we'll say C out, choose an option. And we'll make a new line and then we're going to create a bunch of options here. So I'll create one example and then we will copy and paste. So one, display foods. There we go. So I'm going to take this example and copy it for two, three, four, five, six, seven different options. So we can display foods or two, we can add food to the front or three, we can add food to the back Four, we can remove food from the front, or we'll just say from front. Five, we can remove food from back. And then negative one is going to quit. So this will be save and quit. So we're going to have some saving capabilities, which is gonna be pretty sick. And then negative two, or whatever you want it to be, can just be quit without saving without saving. Let's go ahead and get their response. So we will say C out and we'll say your response and then C in to get their response. We'll store it in this response variable right here. So let's try this out so far. We will run this. Currently it's going to print the foods. So we might see some of that at the top. We can remove that. So we can keep displaying this menu regardless of what we put, but as soon as we put negative one, it will close out of it. So, so far so good. And since we also have negative two, we can include that. So we're going to use the and operator, and this might be a little confusing for some of you initially, and let me explain. So while response is not equal to negative one and response is not equal to negative two. It's very easy to say, or, cause you, you don't want the response to be negative one or negative two, but, and if you want to research this concept more, look up D Morgan's law, we will want this to be and. The law basically says that if you flip these to be equal right here, you can then make this or, and then surround the entire expression with an inversion using the not operator. So it'll look like that. So in this situation, it's gonna say response is equal to one or response is equal to negative two, while neither of those two things are true. So either one of those are going to get the same result. So let's just test this out and then we'll test out the other variations to make sure that logic makes sense. So we say five, four, three, two, one, zero, negative one, and that quits. Let's try it again with negative two to make sure that quits as well. Negative two, and that quits. 
Okay, so if we put it back to how we had it, we will invert these and change the or operator to and operator. And we'll just check this. So negative, well, let's try a normal number. All right, cool. Negative one, we'll quit. And negative two quits as well. Now what we can do is we can have a switch to check which value they chose and do custom things for it. So we'll say switch response in different cases. So case one, all we will have to do is print the foods. So let's just go ahead and move this line that we had earlier down. So we'll cut that and paste that in here for case one. And then we will have the break. We don't want to forget that. All right, cool. We'll just do a few cases at a time just to make sure everything's working. Make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Case two is to add food to the front. So to do that, we can use foods.push front, passing in a food object. So food passing in the name and the cost. So to do that, we will need to get the name and the cost from the user. So we'll say C out food and cost. Example would be like pizza, not pu I say puzzles, pizza 42.32. And we'll just let them type that in. Hopefully they can figure out the format and then we will get the user input and we will put these in two temporary variables. So we can go ahead and create a string food and a double price or uh, yeah, cost, let's go cost. That'll allow us to read both of those. So food and, or you could call a name if you wanted. Yeah, I think we'll go with name just to match the properties exactly. So name and name. All right, so then these can just be passed in here. So name and cost. All right, let's test this out to see if we're on the right track. So run. So we can display the foods and you can see bananas, cheese, burgers. Let's go ahead and add a uh, space after everything just to make the output a little bit cleaner. So you can do that here. See out a new line character. All right, so one to display that menu. Add a food to the front. Let's go with that example, pizza 4232. And then we display the foods and check it out. Pizza is now added to that list. Now it's not stored in the file because we haven't written to file yet, but we'll talk about that soon. All right, so we're on the right track. We just got to continue building this out and continue to improve the looks of it as we go. So case three is going to be very similar. Um, don't be an idiot like me and forget the break. So break. So we'll actually just probably have the same exact C out and C in. We'll just change which spot that we're putting it in the array, so or the uh, deck. So three is add food to the back, so we'll just switch it to push back. All right, that I'm gonna assume is working, but we can test that later. So case four, now it's going to get a little bit different. This is going to be to remove something from the front or back. So you can remove with pop front and pop back. So we'll just say C out removing. And then we'll say foods dot. And unfortunately, when you pop from the front or back, it doesn't return that element. Otherwise, we could just do it here saying foods pop. But instead, we're going to say foods dot front, which will grab that element. And then we can get the name property or the name attribute whichever you want to call it on that object. And then I will just say dot, 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 new line. And then we can say foods dot pop front and then break. Let's test these two out. So three and four. All right, let's test three out of food to the back. So we'll say three pizza and we'll say 43 68 and now when we display it you can see pizza is at the bottom here 
looks like I forgot the break, which is why it was removing the other element there. That gets me all the time. So don't worry about it if you make that mistake. We caught it. That's why we test. Let's try this again. So three to add it to the back. Pizza, 41, 78. And now we can display the foods and it lists four of them with pizza at the bottom. We can then remove from the front, which we kind of tested in the previous run because we forgot the break, but let's just run it anyways. And you can see the first item was removed. So before we had bananas, cheeseburgers, pizza. Now we have cheeseburgers, pizza. All right, so let's go ahead and copy that behavior for case five. Just do it on the other end. Case five, see out. I'll just copy. Copy this, paste, and we'll say pop back. That is what my chiropractor does, and that should work. So let's go ahead and go on to case negative one, which is going to be a little bit different. I'm just going to add the break in here so I don't forget, and we'll say case negative two, break. So for case negative one, we will just say food, colon, colon, and then write which currently does not exist. So we will just make that. It's gonna be pretty similar to reading the foods. It's just gonna be a little bit different. So then we'll pass in our foods and we will go implement that now. Scrolling up to our class, here we have the read foods. We can do something pretty similar. We will say static void write foods and pass in the thing we want to write. So it's going to be a deck of type food and we'll call this foods and instead of a semicolon we want to open that to curly braces of stream we'll call it file passing in the file name the file name foods.txt close off those quotes so far so good and now we can just iterate through all of the foods and write to that file so we'll say for food food coming from foods and then file the food dot name, a space, and then food dot cost, and then an end line. Real quick, one other thing I want to do is after the switch statement, just output a new line just to make things look a little bit better. So we'll display the foods. That's what it looks like. Much cleaner. We can add a food to the front. Tacos is cost 11.11. .11 display the foods now see where tacos is we can add a food to the back with three and this is going to be churros and this was 1076 display the foods now and you can see the churros is down there at the bottom so we should now be able to remove these so we can say four and that will remove the top one and then we could say five to remove the bottom one and you can see that now if we do it again so we'll say five, we can see there's only two items left. Let's go ahead and add a food to the back, or you could re change that to bottom or whatever words make the most sense to you. So we got bananas and cheese. Let's go ahead and add ham. And this costed $40. And now you can see these are our foods. We will do negative one to save and quit. And there you go. Now, when you take a look at that file, inside of the debug here you can see ham has been saved so when we execute our, our code again those are the foods that should be read and you can see it's kind of saved our location if you do negative two right now it's just going to end we don't actually have a case for that because we don't need to save so you could just remove this or just leave it there as empty if you wish doesn't matter i want to show you one other thing and it's totally unrelated this is pretty much the end of our application and that is the ability to read foods but using references instead of passing everything by value so to do this we could say static void read foods and we'll just leave that empty for a second inside of here what we're going to do is we're going to take a deck of type food and we're going to use the ampersand, which is how you say a reference and call it foods. This will allow you to change the data passed in. So be aware of this, that functions can often change the data that is being passed in. So we'll say pretty much the same concept as what is up here. 
So we'll just delete this and I'm just going to copy these lines of code. We're not going to need this variable since one's going to be passed in. So we'll copy that, paste it here. And we'll just change this to foods. We don't need to return foods since the data itself is going to be changed. So let's talk about how you would actually invoke this function. So here, instead of doing this here, we'll just leave it like so. And we'll say food, read foods, and pass in the foods variable. This should allow the application to work essentially the same way. So we'll display the foods. You can see that worked. So it seems to do the trick. So what is the difference? Well, you can see here, foods has no data, but after this line, it has three elements in it. So it was able to change that original variable, which we talked about in an earlier video. When you pass a vector or a deck in this situation, it's a whole different structure and you have to return that to replace the original. But in this situation, we're actually changing the original because we defined the parameter as a reference. That's just kind of scratching the surface. I have dedicated videos on references and pointers on my channel. Definitely check it out. Thank you so much for watching. This is actually going to be the last video in this beginner series. We might do an intermediate. So let me know. We'll see what you guys thought down below if you want to continue this process. Thank you so much for watching and stay tuned for some upcoming series. We got a lot of cool stuff coming. Thank you again and I'll see you in the next video.